You're listening to Mark of the Maker. Hey everybody, you're listening to Mark the Maker and I'm Mark Steiner and this is episode 26 of our podcast. This is something we've been talking about doing for a long, long time, uh, our next history episode uh, and this one's about Bob Loveless. So we have the crew here, but we also have a special guest who's joined us this time that's really going to help fill in a bunch of blanks and teach us some, I would expect, a bunch of things we don't know about Loveless and the Loveless shop and some of the history that is important and we think relevant for the knife community at large. So um, let's uh, go around and make sure we got everybody here. Mr. Tom Krein is with us, I believe. Yes, I'm here. All right. And Michael Birch is here as well. Here. And Sean, say hello to the kids at home. Hello, kids. (laughs) <laughs> that was creepy that's not creepy come to my windowless Jeez. van children <laughs> this time we have a special guest who agreed to join us so we really appreciate him taking the time to chat with us and that is uh knife maker and friend of the show i think is safe to say mr david sharp david welcome to mark of the maker good morning welcome david i'm not happy getting up at four o'clock in the morning but i'm here <laughs> <laughs> We rolled David out of bed. He took a shower and everything to join us, so we feel honored. We run a tight ship around here. That's right. All right. So this is a history thing. As usual, our our disclaimer for history episodes is we're going to get it wrong. Uh, There's a lot of people out there that are believed to be or self-proclaimed loveless experts, and so we're probably going to get some things in here that they disagree with because... There's a lot of urban legend around Loveless and the Loveless shop. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of that part of it. Um, We're going to roll through a timeline to kind of lay out who Bob was and kind of the evolution of the shop over time. And uh, there are varying dates written down in different places and talked about on videos and all kinds of stuff. But we're going to give you a version of it that's, we believe, pretty close or as close as we know how to do at this point. So take it all with a a little bit of a grain of salt, but we're going to give you our best shot. So David's here and David agreed to help us out with sort of the usual kickoff piece of this, which is why are we talking about Loveless and the Loveless shop? So David, you want to take a swing at it? So I I guess it's pretty large. I I mean, it's simple. I mean, you could say, oh, well, Loveless was this groundbreaking guy. Sometimes you hear, oh, he was a father of modern knife making, things like that. I guess from the collector standpoint, to me, history is important, and I'm a significant collector. I have a couple hundred knives, and I like to know the history behind different things. And to see that uh, so many knife manufacturers have either mimicked or licensed loveless knives over the years, you know, they feel that the designs are significant enough to base their sales on, uh, to continue until recently. I mean, Gerber is still continuing to make uh, loveless pattern knives. I think from a collector standpoint, that history, the fact that it's touched so much is very important. To the maker, I think the lesson from uh, Bob Loveless, the Loveless shop, is that don't stagnate. It's one of those things that there was always a push to improve, whether it was a process of making a knife, whether it was uh, better steel, uh, better steel formulas, um, handle materials, things like that. I mean, even when it comes to designs, they uh, listen to feedback from, well, especially users, users, uh, the Japanese market, things like that. Oh, well, we like the way you did this, or we don't like the way you did this. And so there are pattern variations significant for a lot of the knives. And so as a maker, that's the way I look at it is just a lesson to uh, continue to aspire to better and not kind of just sit on your laurels. There you go. Very well said. One of the reasons that we were very excited to have David join us for the show is that David very much gets what we are trying to do with Mark of the Maker, which is talk about history, talk about current stuff, talk to makers about what they do, talk to collectors about why they pursue the things they pursue and just kind of the the overall combination of the history and kind of where this whole thing 
is and is going and came from. And in this case, very much a case of where things came from. And, and there's no doubt that the Loveless legacy and the legacy of the shop um, has massive impact on where we are today and likely what will continue to happen in the future. So mm -hmm. David, thanks again for taking the time to join us. So we we'll probably should talk a little bit about basic timeline. Tom, you think you want to start with kind of where Bob was born and when, and just give people the the start of the timeline and we'll take it from there. Sure. Um, I think it's interesting also. I think you'll, as we go through this, you can draw some correlations uh, between how uh, Loveless grew up and kind of see how Randall and also Skagel, some of the influences and different stuff uh, come down and it's, you know. It's not hard to connect the dots, right? Yeah, right. This is, this is uh direct influence from Skagel to Randall to Loveless, but even their, how they grew up and, and some of this stuff is pretty interesting. So, uh, Bob Loveless was actually born Robert Waldorf Loveless. Uh, he was born January 2nd, 1929 in Warren, Ohio. From what, it, from what I read, it sounds like he grew up on his grandparents' farm. Um, and it was about 17 acres. And I think this would, this would have been right smack in the middle of the, of the depression. Correct. Yep. So, you know, this is a, you know, young loveless, uh, basically was growing up on a farm, learning to use tools and, uh, yeah, that's where he started. Right. And kind of, a kind of an interesting thing where, you know, very difficult times, right. With the depression and, and struggles for, lots of things in life. Um, you know, at least the farm was there to be able to provide them food and, and other stuff and kind of complicate it by the fact that he was, he was basically raised more or less by his grandparents. Right. And I, and I didn't ever really see why that was because later on he ends up moving back with his mother. It seems like. I believe that's what it said in the logos of the Loveless Legend book. Yeah, around when he was eight years old or something, his uh, grandfather died, and uh, he had to move off the farm back into town. Pretty interesting. Um, you know, I, I read another place where it said they had just enough land to have like a – they had a Jersey cow, and they raised some tobacco and berries and rhubarb or something is what uh, I think the Living on the Edge book said. Right. Uh, which sounds like a pretty cool, you know, I mean – pretty cool way to grow up, you know, uh, definitely would learn the use other of than, tools. Uh, yeah. Other than the depression part, probably. Yeah. It seems like a pretty rough way to, you know, with his dad well, I had mean, damaged lungs from mustard gas. And, and so what was his dad during all this? I don't know. I never could find that other than, you know, basically he was absent from what it sounded like. I'd say he was probably laid up. I, it, it seems that way. I don't know. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't really say. Uh, but I mean, if during the depression, a farm is going to be a better place than than most places, I would think. Oh, it's necessity. Yeah, you, know, you have to. Yeah, you have to be able to hunt and uh, grow and create right. your own food. Yep. So, fast forward to 1943. Um, uh, basically. Uh, in that era, he would have been around 14 or 15. Is that correct? What you guys kind of were seeing? Yep. Yeah, I've got uh, 14. He, he basically met, uh, Ernest C. Hall and, and he, he had, he was driving by that time. And he also was working at a, it's like a grass strip, right? Sounds like, uh, and, uh, basically he, he was learning how to, to fly for working there. And then one day he uh, he swiped the plane while his boss was gone and uh, soloed at 14 and uh, <laughs> basically landed when he saw his boss driving back in the Studebaker, I think it said. And uh, yeah, so early on he's flying, which Bo Randall flew also. Yep, very good point. And then, you know, he, he basically altered his birth certificate so he could join the Merchant Marine because he wanted to help in the war effort which Skagel was, uh, was he merchant Marine or was he, uh, he wasn't merchant. Yeah, he Marine. was merchant Marine. Was he? So yeah, there's another tie right there. Yep. Yep. So yeah, pretty interesting. After, after he 
turned 17, legally, he, uh, he joined the Army Air Corps, which was basically what became the Air Force. Um, this was after the war, and they put him on Guam and Iwo Jima. Um, and I guess it was pretty, some pretty boring uh, service. And he, uh, he ended up mustering out in 48, and I found it interesting, which is uh, this was something that made me think of, you know, some of us were into watches and stuff. And with the money he got from uh, mustering out, he bought a Rolex, which he had all the way up until 92 when Living on the Edge was uh, written. Nice. I think he liked his Rolexes. That's pretty cool. Well, I think he liked a lot of the stuff that a lot of us like. I mean, watches, <laughs> knives, guns. I mean, it's pretty cool. The way it makes references Funny how that works. a couple times about wanting to make knives as good as, you know, as precise as Rolex. Evidently, his last purchase was a Rolex, a very significant purchase two days before he passed. Oh, so wow. So he had a huge nice. fondness for the Rolexes and, uh, you know, fancy stuff like that. Any idea which model it was, just out of curiosity? Let's just put it this way, that I don't know the, the model, but it costs about half of what my house cost. <laughs> <laughs> and David lives in California, for reference. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that's I, I was in shock, and but with some of the things I've seen in the shop, I do not doubt it. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and so in the notes I had, it's I had that he finished up at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, which is kind of interesting. So his last stop during his his time in the service, at least that first round. Excuse me, I don't have a, a lot to add to this. You know, this it, uh, he was very much involved in the logos of the Loveless Legend when it was written, and uh, you know he furnished the the patterns on the one inch square graph paper for that book and. You know, it was very, very involved. So I'm assuming, again, because I, I had never met him, uh, everything I know is by interviews with uh, Jim Merritt, like I said earlier, uh, prior to the show. All the fellows that kind of wandered through the shop in the course of the mornings or the days that I was in there, you know, it was kind of interviewing those folks. So I'm assuming that that book specifically, and I'm only referring to that book, uh, it was pretty accurate as far as his history goes. Yeah. And, and I would, you know, I would agree with that because it was copyrighted in 92. So he would have been what, 60 something, somewhere in there. And as opinionated as we know Bob was, if there was any errors, I'm sure <laughs> somebody would have heard about it. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. I guess one of his sayings that he used to say a lot was uh, that whoever has the most toys when he dies wins. So I guess that was really, he kind of lived up to that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Well, the uh, boys were telling me that uh, one of their earliest memories was, uh, well, the shop was kind of sprinkled with the Kennedy machinist tool chest. That was uh, the favorite. And uh, there were actually multiple drawers of the uh, little... I think that, and forgive me, I'm not a camera guy. Uh, the Minox, the little spy James Bond type cameras. Yep, yep. Yeah, he had cool. a particular fondness for those cameras. And uh, there were drawers full of those, just with rows of those cameras in them. And the first time I visited, multiple Rolexes lined up on the, the desk. And so it, it does go along with the fact that... Uh, he definitely enjoyed his man jewelry or the finer things in life. And yeah. Right. Right. So after he, he got out of the service, he went to Chicago's armor Institute of technology, which later became known as Illinois Institute of technology. And, uh, while he was there, he took a course taught by, by Mies, which is very cool. The last director of, uh, Bauhaus in Germany. So industrial design, um, super influential, uh, instructor, which is a very interesting little point. Yeah, I found that to be very interesting, and I can see the carryover. So it sounds like he did that for a while and then came back to Ohio and went to Kent State for a bit to study literature and sociology. And I think if you watch um, 
some of the video of Bob or interviews with him. Um, he, he definitely a well-spoken guy. I mean, <laughs> like Tom said, of, of a strong personality, but definitely, um, definitely a guy who you could tell by the way he talked and the way he spoke that he was very well read. And, uh, it's not like there's a very impressive library in like scattered throughout the shop. Is that you saw that David as part of your visits there? I mean, when you walk in the hallway, turn the corner, there's the restroom. And the restroom was basically toilet to ceiling books. Uh, there was uh, uh, shelves behind the toilet and everything from the Bible to dictionaries. Uh, it was huge on kind of pulp detective novels. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, a lot of uh, other books. Because, like you said, when you look at the interviews and stuff, he definitely was a well-spoken person. And there was a lot of uh, books that were not pulp. They were not fiction. And, uh, yeah, those and movies. So rows and rows right. of uh, movies and books. What kind of movies did he do? Like, I had no idea he was a, a movie buff. It was very much the same. Uh, actually, uh, Jim and him helped finance a movie back in the 90s. And they both played a part in it. Uh, they both had minor roles. Jim played a detective. And I only I saw the clip once. I think, if I remember correctly, the DVD that came out after Bob's death has a reference to it and has a clip of Jim, you know, suited up like an L.A. police detective. Right, but, right. But uh, they helped finance that. And uh, he actually had an in, uh, Bob did, an in where people would send him uh, – preview copies of movies and things like that from Hollywood. But again, largely kind of the secret agent, detective, law enforcement type of genre. Huh. Well, and, and living on the edge, uh, logo of, of the Loveless Legend, uh, basically it talks about his love of books and movies and the English language in there. And it says uh, two of his favorite movies are The Last Emperor and Shane. Uh, it also mentions a bunch of different books in there. It's pretty cool that, I mean, that's something that most of us, at least that run in my circle, were, were into books and movies and uh, really, really cool. I think in the, I think in that uh, video or, or whatever about the Loveless Shop, David, it, didn't, it, didn't Jim say in that movie that, Bob watched the Godfather like hundreds of times. Like he constantly had that going in the shop. <laughs> yeah. Well, my understanding is that, uh, you know, because the shop was behind the house and there was kind of, the house is kind of, well, it's where Riverside kind of meets old agriculture. And so it's kind of an old farmhouse and the shop at evidently at one point was a doctor's office. Huh. And so it's a crazy kind of Warren of of little tiny rooms, and oh, weird. The off the office is literally only as wide as kind of a modern hallway in a house, and but it's just well, I'd probably say it's about six foot, six seven foot wide by maybe twenty feet deep, and so everything was crammed in there. The point of the story is that he was more of a night owl, whereas Jim uh. would get in. When I first met Jim. And I'm a super early riser. I, I would meet him at the gate sometimes at four or five o'clock in the morning, whereas Loveless wouldn't come out until midday after lunch, things like that. And then if he was working, if he was designing, if he was watching movies, everything was in that little tiny office. And that's where he spent his time late into the night before he went to bed. So they kind of had complete polar opposite people complete polar opposite schedules. Quite interesting. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. Probably what kept them together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So in 1953, Loveless returned to the Merchant Marines and started working on a tanker ship based in New York. And this is bringing us toward where we're wanting to go with the knives, because it was while he was working on this ship that he visited Abercrombie and Fitch to purchase a Randall knife. And now if we go by the logo of the Loveless Legends book, the clerk who was there to assist him was Schmarmy. 
and kind of set a bad tone from the get go. And then he tells Loveless that they're out of Randall's and there's a nine month wait. So I th- and from how I read it, a little bit out of spite and a little bit out of the need to have the thing, he decided he was going to make his own knife. Yeah, it sounded angry, right? Right. Uh, uh, just a li- Now, man, I can feel it. Yeah. That's the way I get treated a lot of the time when I go to watch stores and stuff. Yeah, yeah. They act like I'm, you know, they're just waiting for me to pull the gun. So I know where he's coming from. So what happened? Well, he hops in a cab. He's heading back to the ship and he stops at a scrapyard and he decides to buy some leaf springs because... He said that for whatever reason, leaf springs seem like they would make a good blade. So he stops at this junkyard, tells the fella he needs some leaf spring. And the fella tells him, well, you see the guy with the torch burning over there? Go talk to him. So he goes and talks to that fella. And the fella tells him, well, what you want, best springs in the yard are Packard springs. And he buys a pretty decent bit of Packard leaf springs and heads back to the ship to start working. Now, originally, he was using the galley stove to forge these knives. So he gets a knife forged out, gets it done to where he wants it, and a bit of trial and error on that from the reading, especially in the heat treat part, because he originally heat treated it and then didn't draw it back, and he was having problems with the edge crumbling, and he talks to the ship's engineer. The ship's engineer tells him he needs to temper it back. He proceeds to go to the library, reads up on tempering, tempers it back, and uh He said it was a very, very good knife, said it was a hell of a knife. And uh, he had it for quite a while until it disappeared from his shop. Yeah. And and one of the things that I read, uh, you know, after their force, he was grinding these on like a clay based wheel, uh, which. Yeah, I read that. That was crazy, right? (laughs) Clay based. Well, you imagine it didn't. Clay based. Tell I was just going to say, you probably imagine even if they had two by 72 grinders, the belts were not really up to what we use nowadays. For sure. Oh, yeah. You know, they were nowhere near what we're used to at this point. In well, time. even in the 70s, they still sucked. The The <laughs> belts, you know, talking right. to Dozier, I mean, they would go through belts like crazy finishing one knife. They did not have silica carbide belts. But were they 10 bucks a piece? Well, they probably weren't cheap either, though. I mean... You know, yeah, probably the equivalent, the dollar equivalent of the day. That was the best belts they had. But yeah, he is. I read somewhere that he grounded on a clay based wheel, which I was like, what the heck is that? Yeah. What is but that? I guess it'd be some kind of a friable wheel that, you know, the abrasive was in some kind of clay. But I don't, I don't know. Huh. That was my guess when I read that years ago, back when I kind of went down the loveless rabbit hole before I got to visit. It was, uh, you know, my assumption it was some type of uh, a stone type grinder that broke down quicker or something, you know, you see the old uh, English photos of the guy straddling the big uh, wheels. That's where my imagination went. I wouldn't imagine. Not really clear. I wouldn't think they'd have a wheel that big on a ship, but yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. That's where my imagination went, but uh, not really clear what that meant. Or what that was. I think the ship's cookie was a little bit pissed off to walk in and see someone heat treating on the stove. <laughs> he gave him permission. <laughs> well, with some of the stories I've heard and the payments that Bob made with knives, there probably was a knife exchanged. Uh, yeah, you're right. right. So one thing worth noting, I think, is you know, we we talked about um Abercrombie and Fitch in the in the Randall episode and I think even in the Skagel episode and uh, just again to remind people at that time Abercrombie and Fitch was a a real almost like a outfitter but like a retail outfitter kind it of organization. It wasn't almost it was like an REI kind of thing but of the day, right? Yeah, if you had money, I mean it was it wasn't for for the poor people. It was like uppity up. My understanding is they outfitted safaris and things like that. Yeah. So it was a true hardcore, you know, sporting outfitter, maybe even worse than REI or better than REI. <laughs> I don't know how you'd want right, to say right, that. Right, right, right. Well, it was it was for people hunting and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's where you went to get your $50,000 shotgun or whatever, you know. The point being, right. it wasn't next to Hollister at the mall. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> nope. <laughs> The other time relevant thing here, right? I think, you know, today we're in this time when there's seemingly 
infinite number of custom knife makers. And, and in this era, that wasn't the case, right? I mean, these weren't people, there wasn't like a massive population of makers doing this kind of stuff uh, out there at all, right? There's only like four or five guys. Well, well, the, at least of people of note is the better way to say that. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say go. that either because we still had never gotten into the antebellum period of, of knife making. Um, let's say in some other parts of the world, there hasn't been that type of custom knife making. The way I kind of think about it, I, I kind of look at like uh, Bill Moran and Bob Loveless as kind of neck and neck and sharing the same space, but going in two different directions. And I think, you know, before Bob Loveless, there were the knives that were handmade. Maybe you might call them custom. I don't know how they would define them back then. Were largely utilitarian and largely kind of an offshoot of blacksmithing. Uh, kind of like, I believe, from what I've read with Moran, it was the more traditional forged knife and, and carrying on that tradition. And Loveless, as quickly as he could, separated from that you know, to the stock removal and the hunt for better steels and, you know, those type of things. It appears he went pretty quickly from that after he realized, I guess the story is there was a guy that came over, a Dave Taylor showed up with some O one one that was, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going a little weird on me. It showed up with some that, that he didn't have to forge out. And he's like, oh yeah, that's a, uh, seems a lot easier. And and there was some people that were already doing that. You know, Morseth basically was a stock removal uh knife maker in an era of forge, you know, forged blades. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think Loveless, from what it sounds like, he moved away, like Birch said, as soon as he could. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it appears he was very pragmatic with his knife making. He wanted to make the best. It didn't seem like he cared about, you know, I think in this day and age, if someone said you had to be forged, you'd be like, well, that doesn't make sense if I can make it just as good, you know, doing it stock removal. I would agree. You know, my point being is you still had, to me, you have your 18, late 1800s, Will and Finks and prices and stuff going on in San Francisco type of buoys sure. and stuff. So it's, it's hard to, these are the guys Chef that kind Will. of, yeah, that kind of brought our custom world up. But at the same time, we had those going on over there too, which is kind of interesting that the two never seemed to meet. But that's a that's a whole different podcast. So Sean, what happened, dude? He he made this knife. What did he do with it? Well, man, he took it and showed it. Well, he was going to take it back to Abercrombie and Fitch, and I'm guess maybe rub it in that kid's nose. But the kid had already lost his job, and uh, I guess the manager for that department was there at the time. And Bob showed him the knife, and the dude ate it up, and he promptly ordered some. And now when you say some, I thought this was interesting. He did he didn't like want five or whatever, right? No, he wanted was it a gross? He, well, yeah. I guess he ordered three and then after the three he ordered a gross. I'm like, who orders a gross of knives? Uh I found that I found that an interesting number to order. Yeah, so yeah, they did the initial order for three and they sold super quick. And when he came back, the manager was like, Hey, we've been looking for you everywhere. I need to order some more knives. And he's like, well, how many do you want? And ordered a gross of knives. And Bob immediately went to the bank and took out a loan for $1,000 to buy new tools to crank out that gross well, of knives. Actually, he told him he couldn't do a gross. He did half a gross. So he did, yeah, half he did gross. 72 knives. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but he wanted a gross. I, I just, I mean, it's funny, funny numbers. Yeah. And well, he proceeded to build those 72 knives in 74 days. And he delivered them to Abercrombie and Fitch, got payment, and promptly went and paid his loan off. That's crazy. Which is kind of impressive if you built four knives total. I mean, that takes some some balls, right? To uh, yeah, be like, yeah. oh, you want you want one hundred forty four? How about seventy two? Yeah, I can and do seventy two. <laughs> <laughs> like that, like that's a it's comprehensible like <laughs> number for someone who's made four. And I guess four. he, he yeah. he really didn't know much about it besides what he'd made and what he'd read in an article about Randall, you know, but yeah. So he read the article in true. Yeah. And then he'd read another article on, on knife making it said, and then he built four and he's like, yeah, I got this. That's a big old set of balls right there. And then take mm -hmm. a loan out on it. And he bought himself a heat treat oven, an anvil and a belt sand or belt grinder. 
belt grinder. I wonder what that belt grinder looked like. I find it pretty funny because one of the first projects that uh, Jim finished was the anniversary knives, which were stacked leather handles. Yeah. And evidently, Bob was not patient, even with semi-modern grinding belts and grinding leather. He would burn them to the point they had to throw them away. And so even back then with inferior tools, he was able to churn out that many stacked leather handles. So it was a different time or, or his, yeah, this would... his push, his drive was tremendous back then. So these were the first Delaware made knives, right? You're, you're correct. They were, they were leather stacked knives if, you know, and not a small knife. They were like four to five inch blade, correct? I believe so. That's, that's, I mean, I, with the equipment I have, and I've made more than four knives, building 72 knives in 74 days would be, that'd be pretty tough to do. I mean, I could do it, but it'd be a push, right? My best in nine years is, uh, 20 knives in 29 days and I was dying. And so I, I can't even imagine. Well, and he wasn't, it's not like he was doing nothing but knives, right? This was. He was still a merchant often. marine, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Said in the book, he was often up until two in the morning working on knives, but that's pretty, that's, I love it. Yeah. Well, they say old guys are made of a lot sterner stuff than us. Don't believe it. We can do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And and one of the numbers that I saw um, was that he made uh, about a thousand knives for Amber Comrie called the called the Delaware Maids, and I I couldn't really uh, find that, but that's over a six year period. So you know, at first when I saw that, I was like, for real. Uh, but when you start looking at the numbers, that's only about what two hundred a year or so. So that's that's not that's not too far of a reach, but I I would have never thought it was that many. Yeah, it seems like a lot, but who knows? I mean, I think so many of those have disappeared due to, you know, corrosion or loss or whatever. I, I've heard stories of guys that uh, took them over to Africa and then they give them away to their pack bearers and such. So I, I don't know there's any way to confirm or deny that. Well, nobody then. I'm guessing those got worn out. Yeah, nobody knew what they were going to be. You know, they, just, they were just a using right. knife. Wow. Right. So we saw the note that there was a th around a thousand or over a thousand at, and so Loveless landed in Delaware in the late 1950s. Right. And it sounds like at some point the, uh, these Delaware maids outsold Randall made knives at Abercrombie. And that was a point of pride for Loveless. Oh, for sure. Oh, I bet so. As it would be for anybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. No offense, but I'd have a grin from ear to ear. <laughs> yeah, I mean that I mean really I mean that Randall was the the benchmark at that time that's what mm -hmm. you know he he went in wanting to buy and basically was told take a hike and uh you know within a a 6 year period he's selling more than Randall so that's that's pretty epic yeah yeah and that's not belittling Randall that's just saying how good the and popular the Loveless were Right. So I I, th I guess time I'm trying to remember the the Randall timeline the the Loveless timeline is shifted but overlaps a bunch right yeah. it's a little later but in the same kind of era so I, I know Birch disagreed with my point earlier but the contemporaries of Loveless at the time were guys like Randall Morseth Ruana and Bill Moran right kind of the big names right. of that yeah. that era and his contemporaries in the work. Rick Tig, um, but yeah, that would, that would be correct. Yeah, there's a lot of those guys like that, but it's kind of weird that they kind of ran their own kind of circle and kind of fed off each other. Well, they, they weren't friends on Instagram. Well, that's true. But I think they all were aware of each other. I yeah. mean, the first, I think the first month, you know, early on in my fascination, there was this thing that floated around uh, Blade Forum that there was this mystical drawer of knives in the loveless shop just full of and it was worth a million dollars you know i'm getting a little bit facetious here but uh so i saw that drawer and interestingly the drawer was full of uh more seth knives originals i think there was mm -hmm. four of them in there there was a, a knife from dozier 
and a couple of the Japanese Loveless style makers. And so Bob actually was a fan. You know, he wasn't just a maker. He wasn't somebody that uh, was just, oh, I'm the greatest. He actually loved other people's work. Right, right. When I worked for Bob Dozier, he he talked to Loveless quite a bit. He actually went out there and visited and uh, they were they were pretty good friends. Um, Bob Bob Loveless helped Bob Dozier set up his leather shop and helped him with some of that a little bit. And uh, Bob makes a, a heck Bob Dozier makes a heck of a good sheath, very similar to the Loveless style now. One of the, I guess, uh, crowning points in my collection is uh, a drop point hunter that Bob Dozier made for Bob Loveless. And it's a green canvas Micarta. It's a 154 CM and it's marked number one. And I, awesome. I took it to bullet, yeah. my very first blade uh, and held it out to Bob Dozier. You recognize this. Holy cow, how'd you get a hold of that? So kind of a cool thing. But yeah, oh, just yeah. pointing out. Evidently, he also, uh, uh, Bob Trezola spent quite a bit of time in there. And the, the drive was to teach the Loveless shop how to do Kydex sheaths, of all things. Because <laughs> they thought that Kydex would be simpler, would be stronger. Um, you know, because Loveless was just rampant or that's nah, not the right term. Very adamant about how a sheath should fit a knife. And uh, he thought, well, maybe Kydex would be a better thing than than leather. Didn't end up happening. But uh, anyways, he, uh, he would reach out and try to learn or help people as best he could. Would have loved to have had a conversation with him. Well, kind of back to your your kickoff comments, David, it, it sounds like that constant drive to do better, more improve, right? It's a, a very consistent theme. Right. Right. And I, it seems like in the, the feeling I got from some of the stuff that we dug through and getting ready to prep for the show, you know, we've talked in past episodes about how, you know, today, at least the guys on the show feel like, hey, we, you know, this this is a a trade or a craft where, you know, there should be sharing of information, and we're supposed to help teach one another how to do this stuff. And it, handing down information is sort of part of the craft or or the trade. It's part of what keeps it alive, and it's a positive thing. And I, it sounds like maybe back in this era, there wasn't necessarily as much of that, right? There were. There, things were a little uh, closer to the vest in lots of cases. And one of the things that it seemed like I read pretty consistently across the material was that Loveless was in many ways the opposite there, right? He, he was not afraid to teach people that was part of the whole guild thing, right? Was furthering knife making and other stuff. And what, what's your take on that, David? Is that a fair assessment or no? Absolutely. But maybe not. Okay. <laughs> so the absolutely is, uh, you know, the, the very first time I met, uh, now, now I never saw, and I'm a kind of a weird person. I, I'm an avid reader. I'm able to take what I read and put it into whatever I want to do. So I've never made, seen a knife made. So I just was able to, you know, ask very pointed questions. And then I brought my work in. Well, probably should change this, probably do this. And I adjusted and on and on. So, I mean, in my head, I can hear it to this day, Jim, there's no secrets in this shop. There's nothing that anybody can do to hurt us. So we have no secrets. So that was the tagline. And that was, uh, I'm like, is that just you? This one, I was, you know, we kind of had this relationship where I could ask him anything. And he was very candid. It's like, well, is that just you, Jim, now that Bob is gone? Nope. That was always our thing. But Bob kind of demanded respect. And so if you came in with a knife that was supposedly his design and it was less than you thought it should be, well, you found out about it. Right. Or people that came in and uh, even to the end, people that demanded that the loveless patterns be shared. Nope. But oftentimes the folks that would send a letter to Jim or an email to Jim saying, well, 
you know, I'm trying to make my copy of the Loveless Drop Hunter. How did you do this? Well, then why don't I send you the pattern? Who would have the temerity to, do- to demand? I-, I wouldn't share with them either. I, I, I can tell you stories, and I have proof, <laughs> and I personally have been cussed up one side and down the other for not giving out patterns. Really? So I, I, you know, I have patterns. Yeah, I have patterns because I never asked. I always cared about Jim. I knew about his family. We chatted. I never asked anything of him. You know, I quickly learned that, holy cow, this is one of the greatest men I've ever met. And a lot of people felt that way about Bob Loveless, Marcus Lynn and Rick Clow and different ones. And you respected them. And holy cow, they would give you the shirt off their back. But you were rude, and you quickly found out that <laughs> you received the other end of the shaft, if you will. But uh, right, yeah, yeah, seems, I've had folks, legit. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy. And but you know that's the way I view nowadays. If somebody's you know I'm nobody. I think I have almost nine years under my belt. Uh, but somebody that's hey David, I saw your work in progress back in the day and tried to. I will help you all day long, but the minute you go off and demand or challenge me, well, then we're probably going to end that conversation. Yeah, I think that's the way seems, it kind of goes reasonable. most of the ways. If someone's, <laughs> someone's nice, yeah. I'm going to help them all they want. If they're yeah. a dick, sorry, yeah. no. But See you later. Unfortunately, unfortunately, nowadays, there's a certain segment of the world that feels entitled. This is going to be a little off tangent i guess but i i kind of want to know so we, we live in this world where there's a lot of loveless make type you know style makers who was able to make them and who is not and when did it become okay i guess to make them it's all it's always been anybody can try to make our knives um if you basically have a personal relationship with us. And this was not spoken. It was kind of like you earned your way. Yeah. You can have all the patterns you want and we will help you along as best we can. And hopefully you have the talent or the capability of doing it. Again, I, I hear the I hear the voice in my head. There's no secrets here. Yeah. The the thing they they truly because it was a different time and you know, the, the the logos were not registered, the patterns were not trademarked or copyrighted or patented in any way. It was, you know, like the knife world nowadays, it's largely on your honor. You know, don't trace. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was one of those things that uh, they did not freely give out their intellectual property. I'm aware of a couple of uh, folks that had patterns that asked, hey, I want to hand these out with my knives. Nope. That's not your property. They're basically on loan to you. Yeah. Um, so they were very protective and they knew what they had. And in, in you know, the the Bob-Jim relationship, Jim actually lent quite a bit of hand in, in later designs and new models and things like that. So it wasn't purely loveless all the time. No. But uh, yeah, that was their only way of protecting it is, hey, those guys that treat us nicely, we're going to help. And those that don't. And, and, you know, trying to control who had the pattern in some way. It just seemed like in the 80s, you, some of our, you know, the biggest names out there were making loveless patterns, you know, the 70s and 80s and stuff. So it's, it, I just, it makes me wonder who, who was allowed and who, or was it just became a thing to do, you know, to make a. I don't think there ever, I mean, Jim wasn't around in the 70s uh, at that point. I mean, he was making knives. He was a full-time maker from about 77 to 82 on his own. Yeah. I had posted in my Facebook group some uh, gun, a gun, a gun Digest uh, front cover, win this, uh, win this Jim Merritt knife. So he was actually developing a reputation of his own, and then they teamed up together. Uh, there was never, from my understanding from talking to people, an allow it was either you can copy and do your darndest or you get to know us and maybe we'll share the whole 
as I put it, I use the hashtag loveless formula with you. Mm, okay. Um, so I don't know if that talks around what you're asking or answers what you're asking. I don't know. I, I guess we probably don't, I guess some people probably had permission and some didn't, and we probably just don't, won't know who, who did and who was just kind of going with the flow of, you know. Well, I think, I think Mike Lovett had permission, uh, from what I understand, is that not correct? There, there were two two people that could actually they had, and they had permission to use the Loveless logo on their knives. So Mike Lovett and Thad Buchanan were both able to um, make a knife, and they could put their mark on it, and they could put the Loveless Shop logo on it. Yeah, interesting. And you know, outside of Jim Merritt that that made them. Those were the two that were able to do that. There was recently on eBay one of Thad's knives with the uh, uh, Loveless logo on it. Um, I had never seen one before, and it just popped up. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah, that is interesting. So almost like a licensing, you know, a gentleman's agreement. And I know that Mike Lovett, before he kind of disappeared or for health reasons stopped, um, you know, he spent a lot of time and money and effort traveling to the shop from Texas yeah. and spending time. And he was one of those guys that was a true friend um, to the, to Jim and Bob. Yeah. He, and he just kind of disappeared off the scene. Not what, five years ago, six years ago. Uh, I think it was prior to my time. Maybe, maybe a little um, longer back. Um, yeah. Just a little bit longer, I believe. Eight years. I don't know. Nine. Uh, it's, it's kind of strange. I, I tried to track him down. I never could make any progress. I don't know what happened to him. I would have liked to have talked to him. I know that uh, I could probably track that down. I know that many times when I was sitting in the shop that he would call and talk to Jim. They uh, talk quite often, but um, yeah, but not making knives. I used to talk to him, you know, PMM on USN and stuff because uh, that mm -hmm. was back, okay. back in the time. And then um, you know, like I said, I think he, his wife or him, one or the other had some health issues and he just kind of dropped off the radar. His wife and then somebody said that, uh, you know, and I don't want to spread, but that maybe he had also started to develop some health issues. Yeah. Really talented guy. Absolutely. All right. So let, let's keep moving on the timeline because we actually didn't get from a time perspective into <laughs> yeah. the spot where Jim Jim joins him in the Loveless shop, right? So let's let's just kind of finish up through to that point. So in 1959, Loveless's daughter was sick with pneumonia and it sounded like they needed to get to a little different climate. And that was part of the driver behind the move to California. So at the time they were in Delaware, Delaware. And they moved to Modesto, California in 1959. And then in 1960, moved to Lawndale. And so that's that's one of the typical eras of Loveless knives that is referred to, right? Are the Lawndale knives. It's the Delawares, the Lawndales, or the Riverside. Now where is Lawndale at? It's a little, it's kind of uh, outside of Torrance, LA okay. area. I didn't even know it existed again until I became in, interested in Loveless. And when I was traditionally employed, I was doing some work at uh, LAX. I'm like, I'm going to drive through Lawndale, see what this place is. <laughs> I was scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, it was a different place back yeah. in the day than, than what it is now. Traditionally employed. That's a good yeah. way of putting it. That's uh, that's I've been using that for years because it gets strange looks. <laughs> I like. So so moved to Lawndale in 1960 and was working in uh, in the machine shop, making knives on the side, doing it out of the garage. So 1960 to 1969, Lovell still had a real job. He was traditionally employed. I'm sorry, David. <laughs> <laughs> and so in 1969, he transitioned to make him knives full time in Lawndale. What I, what I found interesting was some of his uh, traditional employment uh, during during that time, right before he went full-time. In the, the Loveless logo book, um, basically he worked for DuPont for a while, and I guess they ended up firing him because they didn't like how outspoken he was and also because he rode a motorcycle, is what he says. Wow. <laughs> Which is, yeah, they, they fired him for that. 
and he went back to making knives. Yes, back then you could. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. It was like I, he he felt that they had invested a lot of money in him, and since he kept riding a motorcycle, they just fired him. Well, we're also hearing his side of the story too. Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Are you, are you saying you've never heard of moto discrimination before, Michael? Not to say it couldn't happen, but, you know, DuPont may have a different story. Well, he also says, he also says that his style rubbed people the wrong way. And What if, yeah. he, what if he walked in and stabbed that. the water cooler every day and said, F off? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's why I made the comment it was a different time. Yeah. You know, empl- employee rights in California weren't what they are now. Well, yeah, employee rights weren't what they are now, and without question, the the industrial world of machining and manufacturing in <laughs> in the late '60s, early '70s, shoot, even through into the early '80s, uh, was not for the meek, right? Oh, yeah. The, the environment, that work environment, is not for suckers, right? That's yeah. And and I'm not surprised at all by the the the, the things you hear about Bob's kind of gruff behavior at times and language and whatever, or the fact that there was an expectation of respect. Because certainly, even in the mid '80s, when I came into that whole scene in manufacturing world, that was 100 percent the way the people I worked with acted. Right, the good <laughs> ones anyway. The people yeah. I wanted to learn from, they were not nice people by a first blush appearance and they 100% demanded your respect and sometimes to kowtow to them a bit. And if you did and you developed a relationship with them, then you were in the inner circle. And like, like you said, David, you could do no wrong, right? You, you became part of the, the team. Right. And you had to earn your way in. As you're talking, I'm thinking about Jeremy Marsh's story on the episode, you know, him working in a shop and, the old guys and him having to earn his way up. Absolutely. So I think that's all very consistent with uh, the experiences that, you know, <laughs> growing up and, you know, I'm sure Merchant Marines wasn't exactly a carnival or Princess Cruise kind of scene. So, <laughs> well, he probably had lived life much fuller than any of these folks that he went to work with, you know, in, right. in the few jobs he had before he went full time. He, he probably led a much fuller, more exciting life uh, <laughs> than most of those guys did their whole. So maybe he was full of himself. Maybe they did ask him to leave. Yeah. Um, I can only imagine. Shit, he made kitchen knives in a kitchen. <laughs> honey, yeah. honey knives in a kitchen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't mean kitchen knives like for the kitchen. I mean in the kitchen. Yeah. On a boat. Yeah. Mark, I, I found it interesting Um I read that, uh, you know, the doctor basically said his daughter needed to move and he makes a statement that he sold his house on Friday and Saturday he was in the car headed west. And within three hours of getting to his destination, he had a job in a machine shop. Dude didn't mess around. No. Right. But, you know, to add to that, he was very, very talented. Uh, I mean, not, he wasn't known just for knives. He had his, uh, what is it? I got to look at my phone. Was it Micro Shop or Micro Machine Limited that he ran in conjunction with the knife shop? Famous for all of his uh, gun modifications. Yeah. I can share that with the Facebook group, uh, letters or correspondence. I'd have to redact them a little bit. People sending in their 1911s and stuff for the loveless treatment. Yeah. I want a Smith & Wesson trail gun really badly. But yeah, I mean- he had a he had a shop of with eighty five employees. Yeah, he's actually That's crazy. He's in one of my uh, old gun digest books of pistol smithing, one of the Jack Mitchell ones. Yep. My point was it just it doesn't surprise me the ease of getting a job or the jobs that he held or the things he was able to do because uh, what what's the old uh, guns of Will sonnet the grandfather no brag just fact. You know, he could back up everything he did. Yeah, yeah. So, from by all accounts. I think he was industrious. I think he was, you know, he had a lot of drive, it seems. Yeah, but before he got that job, did he have any machine shop experience? I mean, I didn't see I, I didn't see anything said about it. 
I don't think he gives a shit about that stuff. He, he, I know. He just went out there and got it. He's like, I want to do this. And he became a professional knife maker after making four. So I don't. But you also don't. <laughs> it's funny because uh, talking to some of the old fellas, it seemed like, you know, he was kind of tight lipped about early years in some ways. And so there's a lot of things that probably people would never know, never will know. And so I imagine, you know, if you're on a ship. Machi- uh, ships have machine shops. He's building knives in the sure. kitchen. Did one of those ships machinist show him the basics or even more than the basics? Uh, right. You know, again, those are things that Jim didn't know. A lot of the old guys that uh, wandered through, and I don't mean, you know, old guys is an affectionate term with me. You know, I, I, I imagine that along the way there were people that uh, gave him tips and, you know, helped him along. Well, and, and one of the things that we've talked about multiple times is, Sean, you're, you're experiencing machining experience plays directly into quality knife making, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm not going to argue, man. So in 69, Lovis starts making knives full time. We pull into 1970 and the Knife Makers Guild comes around. And Bob was the first secretary of the Knife Makers Guild, and it seemed like he was a firm believer in the mission statement for the Knife Makers Guild. And the guild was originally formed by himself, A.G. Russell, Blackie Collins, John Nelson Cooper, and Dan Dennehy. And uh, it was first held at the Sahara in Vegas in February of 1970. And uh, the makers were invited to display. It worked out well, so they did it again at Tulsa. Right. I think there was more than... Than the, I think there's a few more knife maker guild uh, original. Yeah, the members. founding fathers. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I thought it was a few more than that. I mean, those are definites, and I mean, that's a hell of a lineup too. Mm-hmm. And just for those that uh, seen Sean mention the Sahara and the gun show, if anybody wonders, to me, and I know some people that are offended by it, the the nude logo on the Loveless knives. Evidently, were inspired by a painting or a photograph, some depiction of the female form in the Sahara at one of these knife shows, uh, is what inspired that. Uh, oh, that's awesome! Nude logo. <laughs> yeah, very cool. So the guild gets formed, and very shortly after, in 1971, he started working with Steve Johnson. David, do you have any insight into how that kind of happened, or? That time frame, I think there's a few years there where they work together, right? I believe it was uh, between two and three years, and there was only uh, 30 to 40 knives or something like that uh, that were actually marked. That's not, I think some people take it as that's the amount of knives, but that were actually marked uh, Loveless Johnson. Uh, I I believe, if I recall, uh, I had a conversation probably... I've talked to him since a number of times, but specifically with Steve Johnson, I think in 12 or 13, uh, basically Steve was kind of visiting shops. Uh, I believe that he spent time in the Loveless shop. I believe he spent time with, uh, was it Buster Warinsky? Yeah. He kind of was traveling. Um, and this was kind of one of those stops that he made. It seems like I remember something about him being a scout or Eagle Scout or something, and this and that's how he met Loveless was on a project like that. Do you know? If, have you heard anything like that? That uh, that I'm not aware of. Uh, we'll have to. I, I know that to the to this day, I believe that uh, Steve is still involved with scouting. So that's something that we kind of have to reach out and, and check on. I have to follow up on that. That seems like I I remember reading that or or seeing that somewhere, and that's how their relationship started. But huh, interesting. Yeah, at that point, you know, when I kind of had more, it was funny because when I first started this, like I I purchased a a copy of the logos of the level, and this was before I met Jim and was able to visit the shop. It's like, well, I'm going to do my darndest to make a loveless knife and to make you know what I thought would make them proud. So I have that knife or I have that book and it's signed by everybody that we're talking about, except for Bob Loveless. That's awesome. Um, You know, so in in doing that, 
that was my way of forcing myself because I'm not a big people person, uh, but forcing myself to meet and talk to some of these guys and kind of mini interview, if you will. So anyways, that's that. Very cool. So from 73 to 76, he served as the president of the Knife Makers Guild. And then in 74, that's when the move to Riverside, California happened. Did you guys come across in the research or or maybe David knows the the driver for the move to Riverside? Was it, it seems like I read something that said it was because he found that house with the shop attached. That was, that was a motivator. That's also what I heard. There's a fellow that uh, frequented the shop that my understanding is he knew Loveless probably the longest from the late fifties or early sixties. And to this day, he, uh, has a key to the shop. And, uh, if I remember correctly, that's what he told me also. It was just at that shop. Well, back then Tyler street and Riverside, there was absolutely nothing there. So he could do, he could shoot his guns. He could grind knives. He could do whatever he wants. So it was a perfect setup. Okay. So that was in 74. And then we have kind of a time gap, but in 82 is the time frame when, when Jim Merritt joined the shop, right? Correct. So, so in that time period, Mark, there's one thing that I just want to mention real quick and it, and it cracks me up. Uh, he's talking about how he made around 300 knives a year. Uh, but in 1975 or 79, is he 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 has a quote and he says he just simply didn't feel like making knives and he only made 75 that year. <laughs> so one year he just woke up and was like, "Ah, screw it. We're going to do something else." But yeah, that that made me laugh a little bit. My understanding is that there were years that it was as low as 30. Wow. Um huh. evidently during the heyday of the the, the Gerber licensing and those checks and the different uh, collaborations he had going on and the gun work and stuff that he made as low as 30 knives a year, which is incredible because I've also been sent photographs. And I know the first time I stepped in, which was two months after Bob passed, and I think there was 150, 100, 150 knives that were the last batch started before Bob passed that were finished as loveless knives instead of, uh, excuse me, finished as loveless maker instead of the logo loveless knives, but they really could put it out, put them out. Wow. Yeah. I love that. So kind of a, one of the things that I came across, there's some scans out there of some old catalogs and I thought the pricing progression was really interesting. I mean, you know, we have this time, in recent history or the last several years with tactical knives where, you know, there's a lot of back and forth about flipping and speculating and resale values and secondary market drama and all kinds of stuff. But that's not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination, right? I mean, that Lovelace was w- one of the people earlier, much, much earlier on, right? This is many, many years before where the knives were in such demand that the secondary was much higher than the, the direct price from the loveless shop. Right. Cause there's a, I think the best copy out on the internet is, uh, I think the mid seventies. Is that the one that you're seeing? Well, I, I ended up finding pictures or scans of four or five catalogs ranging from January of 1970 oh, wow. to October of 1975. And so this is before things went super bonkers. I mean, I don't think this is into the Japanese collector era yet, right? That's actually about the time um, the Japanese started getting interesting, late 70s. And I don't think the secondary market was quite kicking in, but they were still expensive knives. I mean, it was starting to climb because you can see their pricing was above most other, you know, that I could find. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I, again, I, you kind of, uh, information that's out there is out there and lots of different versions of stories and stuff, but, but at least in the, in the video after Bob's passing, you know, they talked about in the early eighties dropped hunters selling for six to 800 bucks. And then after the Japanese collectors really started going after the new logo knives and other stuff, that's when they jumped into the multi thousands. Um, but even back in, in the early seventies, what I saw in the January 1970 drop point, 85 bucks in June of 72. So two and a half years later, it was up to a hundred bucks 
Two years later, in May of 74, they were 140 bucks. Uh, five months later, they went up another 10 bucks. And then one year later, in October of 1975, they were 175 bucks. So in a five-year period, more than double the direct price. And then because I like big bears, I there was only a few big bear prices in there, but they went 200 to 375 to 450 to 750. So a big bear was 750 bucks in 1975. Holy shit. <laughs> That's nutty, right? That's big money. That's $5 billion in 2019 money. <laughs> 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 well, I yeah, think yeah, that's wild. He he did follow the his market as far as pricing. You know, I, that's always been the the whole oh, never follow your, you know, second, don't chase the secondary, but he very much did and you know, he just didn't leave any money on the table. And good for him. You know. He he demanded a price and and got it. Or he didn't demand, it. you know, he saw what it, those knives were getting and and went for it. Yeah, it, very interesting stuff. Yeah. So, it, so in '82, Jim Merritt joins the Loveless Shop, and there's there was a story in the video that talked a little bit about how that happened or whatever. And David, you from your conversations with Jim, did you guys talk about that? How he came to be a part of the Loveless Shop? And yeah, like I said uh, a bit ago, Jim had actually been full time for roughly about five years, and they would spend time together. They knew each other, you know, probably a little bit better than in passing. And it was one of those things that uh, Bob, in some cases, might be a little bit lacking in his fit and finish. And I think he realized that. And so, hey, Jim, can you come take a look at these knives that I need to ship out? Now, I think the popular story is that they were going to Japan. I've heard different things. But uh, Jim came down, went directly in there, fixed some of the errors. And that's, that kind of tells you that they were similar. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, let me point out some mistakes I see. He actually took the knives into the grinding room and fixed them. And he's like, well, why don't you come back next week? And so evidently, according to both Jim and his grandsons, he for a period of time, he went back every week, every other week to fix Bob's work. And finally, well, why don't you just stay and work full time? And so that's when... It's funny because that story is that, well, come work with me. But basically from that point forward, they were partners. Right, right. Uh, you know, he found somebody that did the same or better. And you can compare knives, better work, and uh, could deal with him in some of the shenanigans. And their partnership started there. Very cool. All right. So that gets us up timeline-wise up to Jim Merritt being, you know, partnered up with Bob in the level shop doing work, Bob gets inducted to the blade magazine hall of fame, the cutlery hall of fame in 1985. And, um, that's about as far as I took the timeline. It was, it's interesting because you're talking about that and because it kind of falls in that same. And while you guys have been talking and I've been kind of listening, um, I was looking through my phone. I have, I have a number of different photographs of correspondence and photographs from the level of shop. And, and one of the most outstanding, and it's dated uh, November 1st of 1983, and it's a kind of a sepia colored photograph. And it's Ron Lake, Jim Merritt, Bob Loveless, Herman Schneider, and um, man, can't remember his first name. He was uh, Jax, they referred to. He was a gun digest writer with a number of Japanese makers at the Hitachi Steel Plant. Huh. Uh, where I'm going with that is around that time, uh, Bob was also helping the Japanese get the Japanese guild going. So he not he gave as much as he got. So everybody talks about money and things. But, uh, you know, ATS-34 was evidently inspired by Bob Loveless, made by Hitachi. Uh, the Loveless Knife Making Guild was spurred or helped to get organized by Bob Loveless. Um, he invested huge amounts of time and effort into the knife world that we now all enjoy. So, and that's, like I said, this has a date on it and I can post that in the Facebook group. It's quite an interesting photo, even though you can't really see, uh, see faces that clearly. Yeah. Very well, cool. 
Well, one one thing I'd like to say, David, uh, you know, same same kind of era, nineteen seventy seven. You know, I think Bob probably did the most influential thing that he did in his life. In my opinion, it affected me the most, and I think most knife makers. But uh, seventy seven was the year he published uh, How to Make Knives with Moran and Barney, and I think that. I mean, that has had to have been a huge influence in the, in the industry for people that want to learn how to make knives. I mean, it, it was like the Bible for knife making to me, you know, still is. I mean, the, the, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic book. It's unfortunate that reproductions are literally, literally photocopies. So the photographs really can't be seen, you know, the, the ones, unless you get an original on eBay, the ones you see on Amazon are kind of reproductions. I might have one of those. Yeah, I hunted down an original, and it's worthwhile getting an original. Um, But it's one of those things that, uh, in my opinion, kind of like Tom, I'm a book nut. I I haven't seen a how-to book that's quite as succinct, quite as good as that book. That's great. But, I mean, huge influence. I'm sure, you know, Sean, Michael, I mean, you guys, I'm sure... Got had that book early on. Oh yeah, first one I got. Well, one of the first two. Yeah, yeah. This might be a good time to segue into uh, Steels and his uh, influence on uh, the steels we use that were used then and are used now, actually, and how much of a uh, oh, kind of a not just heat treat, but a blade steel guru. Well, I mean, yeah, you were talking earlier, Michael. Do you want to hit on some of the stuff, how he progressed through the steels? Oh, well, he started off like you you guys were talking about, or like Sean was talking about, uh, he used Packard steel. Uh, then he got a hold of a Jessup uh, early on, and he used something called, a, it was strange, a uh, 139B um, from Jessup steel. He used that for 10 years, and he forged all that, like we talked about earlier. Um, until a, a guy, a friend named Dave Taylor showed up with some O one one that he realized was, you know, didn't have to forge. And then, and then we talked a little bit earlier, uh, and Dave was talking about how much he was into his steels and created some of these better steels for us makers. Uh, can you kind of go into some of that again, David, for us? My understanding is, and, and we've all of course heard the reason loveless knives are polished is, to help resist corrosion. Well, you know, in recent years, they were CPM 154. He fooled around with different things. Um, He had a batch of BG42 that uh, special knives, as he put it, uh, it's one of those, the steels that he used for people that he knew were going to use their knives. Um, I think I have the last of that batch. I was going to make some kind of commemorative knives if I get a chance. But, um, oh, going back further, talking about Jessup, uh, and I have to give props sometimes when I have to fill things in. I talked to John Denton because he frequented the shop since he was in his teens. Um, But he also actually specified his own steel. And so there was a steel evidently later that Jessup made for him uh, that was called Special Melt. Uh, I guess, affectionately or lack of a better name or things like that. But it was always with the, uh, with the thought of edge retention, corrosion resistance, things like that. And uh, you'll see early knives like at Blade Show that are not polished. They're just uh, a, a belt finish. And it's funny because I, I had a conversation with Jeremy Marsh again about, uh, we were talking about hand finishing. And he had acquired some old uh, old sandpaper, but it seemed very much finer, even though it was rated at like a 400 grit or something like that. Huh. Well, the Loveless Shop, of course, back in the day when they started, and of course, when belts, uh, commercial belts became available, they were using a U.S. grading system, and they finished knives to like a 500 grit. And I, I believe it was CAMI, C-A-M-I, that was like the standard, and... Uh, they would finish them to a 500 grit and then buff them, which blended everything together and and kind of got rid of, uh, you know, some of the grind marks. But it was still not to the the polished finish that we see nowadays. And uh, 
I don't know, just a little bit interesting to those guys that uh, think that Loveless only made polished knives. And so, you know, it's funny, the 154 CM, ATS 34, and then I was thinking about this when I was digging through the notes about all this stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, RWL 34. I wonder if that is RW Loveless as far as the name goes. And I know you had told us, David, that there wasn't wasn't any relationship between Damasteel, who produces RWL 34, and the Loveless shop, but they certainly tipped the hat very hard in Bob's direction when they created this powdered um, RWL 34 steel. Absolutely. I, I believe, I believe it was the owner of the company I spoke to last year at the gathering and he confirmed that. And so, you know, I guess, uh, if the chemistry ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, and like you said, give, give, give credit where it's due. Yeah. Um, so it's quite interesting. That is cool. Well, I, f- I found it interesting that in the, the knife making book, you know, uh, he he recommends O one. I mean, for for those starting, and that's I, I took that advice. I, I bought some O one and <laughs> worked great. Me too. That was my first knives was O one. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> great steel. Yeah, just from that book. Same same here, and and they haven't rusted yet. Nah, it may be that I live in the middle of the Mojave, but uh, you know, it's one of those things that if you take care of stuff. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it takes care based of on on popular opinion, the, uh, I don't know how the the first couple hundred years of our country were how they made it. You know, I mean, how did they survive without stainless blades? <laughs> yeah, you know, I've I've never had a problem with ten ninety five or O one or any of that. Very very few guns are made out of stainless. It's all about the maintenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I know we mentioned, I think earlier in the conversation, but Bob was, Bob designed knives for Gerber, like the Gerber guardian. And some of the people that are, that haven't looked too deep at the knife history in general, I think will think of Gerber as this kind of throwaway company, but certainly in the era that we're talking about here, Gerber was no joke, right? They were a legit significant knife producing company of some significant level of respect, right? Very much. Mm -hmm. They had big names, uh, a lot of some of the most iconic knives um, in their collection. Peter Gerber's company and his stuff was amazing. You know, it's obviously changed some over the years and become a different company, but it it was a massive company making cool knives. Their aluminum handled uh, sporting knives and and kitchen knives were awesome. They're... their folders were really good. They were they made some of their folders with the L6. I've got a couple of them. I mean, they were high performance knives, for sure. I, I've got I've got a Gerber Guardian right here in my hands. Uh, since you know we were doing this, I pulled it out. But uh, I got this knife in probably 1984, 85. I've had it ever since. And yeah. uh, when I got it. It didn't have a sheath, and we were on a vacation to the Pacific Northwest, and we stopped at the Gerber store, and I walked inside, paid $15, and got a new sheath for it. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, that was that was pretty pretty fun. You know, he he designed for other companies, too. What are some of the other uh, things he... he... Schrade. Uh, he, oh, he designed that's right. He some really cool knives for Schrade. Uh, later on, he had some... Uh, Beretta had some designs Mm -hmm. uh who who else they he collaborated with the wood berry wood folders right the ones that kind of rotated around oh you're talking about the uh, the side opening yeah where the hand the one handle you know basically pivoted around Uh the the pivot and and would open and you go the other way to close it yeah uh, the berry wood design stuff he designed some stuff for them it didn't sound like that project went particularly well. Yeah, probably not. But, you know, I mean, think about it. This was this was 30 years ago that he was he was a designer, you know, when who was a designer for for companies, you know, back then nobody. It was a big thing. Right, right. You didn't you didn't just send in a, you know, a computer drawing and 
you know, have a collab or do what it, it, it was. They were drawing the big names. David, did you did you have any conversations with guys in the shop about about that kind of stuff? Bob's relationship with uh, big companies as a as a designer. I know you mentioned that there were years where he really focused on that and spent tons of time on it rather than actually making knives. I think uh, the only thing I can comment on is that it was even more prolific than maybe we actually saw. So I mean, Gerber recently you know, in the last year or two, re, uh, started reproducing the hunters. And I think there's a semi-skinner, a gut hook, and like a drop hunter version. Uh, and you saw Schrade do the same thing, the same thing with the uh, mm -hmm. their improved hunter. But like I'm in possession of a number of unfinished uh, Gerber blade blanks. Um, and there were different hunters huh. and they were never, ever models that were available. And so... And then in being able to and, and uh, you know, visiting kind of nose through the, the filing cabinet and things, there there are a lot of renderings, uh, of course, old school pencil drawings and things like that that are in the filing cabinet that never got produced. But evidently there was a much deeper relationship or a larger relationship than we actually saw produced. Huh. That's very interesting. Well, like you said, some of that was, you know, he, he sometimes would relax a little bit, I guess, not make as many. I wonder if that was not because he was dedicating that time to collaborating or more of a, okay, some money came in from collaborating so I can relax a little bit, you know, that sort of situation. You know, it seemed like he either ran hard or relaxed. It could very well be. Um, some of that, again, was before Jim's time. Evidently, there were times when there was, like you, somebody pointed out a bit ago, that there was a, a point where we don't have any definition kind of between Steve Johnson and Jim Merritt. And it could be that he was focusing on that or he was laying low, doing whatever he wanted to do. Yeah. You know, one of the things that seemed pretty clear based on at least most of the information that we kind of dug up to look at this uh, history is it seemed like at some point he kind of got some combination of bored slash frustrated. Um, I say frustrated, meaning like the whole collector madness around the knives and, you know what I mean? The people not buying the knives to use them, people buying the knives to collect them and getting all crazy about it. And I mean, at some level that has to be rewarding, right? Certainly financially rewarding and good for a person's ego or, or, whatever. But at the same time, if that's not really what you're focused on, then maybe it could be a fr bit frustrating too. I'd probably agree with you. I believe there's quotes in books or interviews and stuff. I, there's a YouTube interview with him at a, an Art Knife Invitational a couple of years back before he passed. And he uh, voiced that frustration. And you know their their wish and their want was just to be a cutlery manufacturer. And uh, you can see that in kind of their, I don't know, the way the knives were built. I was looking for a word, but the way the knives were built. Um, and what I mean by that is, I mean, the knives, the pistols, I have a uh, Ruger 1022 that uh, was modified locally, but to his spec, very, very specific. And it was very much geared at use versus putting on a shelf. And uh, I think that's what people nowadays... Right. And I, I'm a collector of everything. And so I have everything from ABS Mastersmith knives to folders and everything in between, wherever they meet. And uh, a lot of times, uh, especially in certain areas of knife making, they they everything's got to be crisp. Everything's got to be sharp lines. Everything's got to be just... I guess crisp is the best way to put it. And that's not the loveless knife. That's not the loveless pistol. That's not anything that was done. Uh, everything was uh, had melted edges. Everything was ground so that, you know, I think in interviews you'd see on YouTube and old videos, uh, he said it's got to feel like a part of your hand. And that's absolute truth. Uh, I built one right. for myself and uh, I was able to participate in a bison hunt. I think it was two years ago. And I think when we were done 
if I remember correctly, it was 900 pounds of processed meat. Wow. But dressing this animal, three of us, one guy had one of these, the replaceable blade uh, razor knives that you see. Well, it was a new model uh, that I actually designed. Then we had another fixed blade and then this loveless knife, uh, my version of it. And I'll be darned, that old school loveless drop hunter at the end of the day was still comfortable to use, still held an edge and, you know, worked perfectly through the whole task. And that was what their their drive was. That was what they wanted to do is, is use over collectible, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. And you had a modern super steel in that blade, right? Oh, yeah. But you're talking about, I think, if I remember correctly, it was shot around 9 o'clock in the morning. And we got done, I think it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's pretty much straight knife work. Wow. Oh, my point is it wasn't necessarily the edge retention. I, I don't panic over those things. You should be able to sharpen a knife. But the fact that I didn't have a blister in the palm of my hand where the thing, you know, the butt kind of sits when you're going through. Um, you know, when, it, when it's done right, that's the way it should be. No, I thought you were going to say you used uh, 154 CM. I was kind of surprised you used a different steel. Oh, it was, it was, actually mine was made out of A2. <laughs> okay. Almost every knife I make myself is A2. Huh. I think that was a favorite of Bob Loveless is also, if I remember correctly. Seems like I read that in the book on knife making. And it didn't rust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A2 is great steel. Uh, we've kind of glossed over Loveless and Japan, and I'd like to talk more about that. I would like to talk about Bob's influence on Japan and Japan's influence on him. Could you expand on that a little bit for us? So again, it's kind of firsthand related. Again, some of these stories are just from Jim and uh, some of the guys that frequented the shop. But uh, evidently, like, I, again, I've never mi uh, visited Japan, but you know that uh, in Japan, everything is kind of obsessed over, you know, whether it's denim or cartoons or whatever. And evidently, there's uh, folks in Japan uh, that... And this is what uh, I quote, uh, the modern samurai has a Rolex and a loveless knife. This is what I was told. And so they would actually get together to compare loveless knives. So if you had a drop hunter, oh, what, what is your drop hunter the same as mine? And uh, well, they're handmade knives. They didn't use water jet. Everything to the end was uh, ground on a 10 inch, you know, profiled on a 10 inch wheel. Everything was ground on a three inch, a five inch or a 10 inch wheel. Uh, so, of course, everything differed slightly. But uh, the Japanese would uh, actually study every knife that they got their hands on. And then, oh, look what he did here. Oh, I really like that. And so Bob actually listened to some of those things and made changes. Uh, and they were mostly based on how a knife would be used. So like, and I have in my possession many, many patterns, but you'll see that the, the, the drop hunter that everybody, uh, you know, is most familiar with, I believe. Well, it was all, it's always been called a four inch drop hunter, uh, the one that's most popular, but the true old school one was four inches, but over the years it got smaller and smaller. Now it's three and three eighths inches from the tip to the, the beginning of the guard or the front of the guard, so that you can choke up on the knife better, um, you know, in use, not sitting on a shelf type of thing. And uh, huh. he really depended on the Japanese in altering patterns, changing patterns, uh, maybe improving, or not maybe, but improving. And so it kind of goes back with my original initial comments of, it was everything was always a work in progress. Everything was meant to be improved on. There was no status quo. And, uh, you know, that's that's where the, the, the Japanese evidently really were enamored, I guess, because maybe he listened, but because the knives were that good. 
it seemed like he had a very strong appreciation for Japan and Japanese culture and the people there. Where, do you know what that came from, David? Do you have any insight on on why? Is it based on? I mean, it, I wouldn't be surprised um, to know that maybe it was in part driven by the level of respect that they showed Bob or what, what do you think that was all about? That would be my guess. Uh, I do know that at one point he considered moving, uh, but he couldn't have his guns. So that kind of right was out of it. So if, if you actually thought about picking up and leaving and thinking that you could stand a whole other culture, there must be either your respect for them or the fact that they respected you. Um, I know that his uh, widow, uh, the second wife, was Japanese. And uh, so it carried over into his whole life. I think I'm the only one. I have photographs of uh, the loveless sushi knife. One of his favorite things was, uh, I guess, in Riverside, there was a local sushi chef that he frequented. And he made the fella a uh, sushi knife. And he, the guy tried it out and... This doesn't work and gave it back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the whole point, though, is he enjoyed everything, evidently, about the, the Japanese culture. And, uh, it, yeah, it was actually uh, Bob's widow has it now. And I have photographs of it. But uh, wow, nobody had ever seen it before. I posted it a while back and uh, I think on the USN. And uh, some of the big collectors were like, holy cow, where did that come from? Yeah, very cool. That was a plot twist. So again, that's only a guess, um, but I do know that there was a consideration of actually moving there. Yeah. So. So huh. very cool. Did the, the Japanese collectors, were they users or were they, you know, you were talking about how he used a lot of their feedback. So uh, – I guess, what kind of collectors were they? Were they folks that would just collect to collect or were they hunting? Um, what kind of collectors were they? My understanding is there's both, just like here. Um, yeah. You know, there's still a lot of folks that uh, use loveless knives here in the States. Yeah. And I'm familiar with a couple other knife makers that currently make knives and they get sent to Japan for their, uh, I guess they have a very avid hunting. They hunt boar. And things like that. And they also are very avid uh, bushcrafters. Huh. And so huh. my understanding is that there is both, just like here. The the ones that they go in the cabinet are safe and those that actually used them. Interesting. So, David, one of the points that you wanted to talk a little bit about was the Loveless philosophy on knives and making overall. And I know we saw things about, you know, how they – the the shop did knives in batches of some size, maybe varying size over the years, depending on what they had going on or how many things they needed to make. But it, it, there's more to this, right? More to the whole idea of how the the knife making process comes together, right? From a philosophical perspective. Well, where I was going with that, and I kind of touched on it a moment ago, is the way the knife is in your hand in use, and so. I think what's interesting, and this kind of goes to the collectors and whether you have any interest in Loveless or any other, you know, try to handle knives and don't be afraid of, of asking unless you have nice silver rings on that are going to scratch them. Um, the very first knife show I went to, I had started down this rabbit hole and uh, it's like, what in the world is, a, you know, I know they're expensive. I know I like the way they look on a page, but what in the world makes these things special? And I think I told him, but uh, Mark Strauss with, uh, I think on Instagram, he's knifeologist or knifeology. can't remember. Uh, yep. He had a drop hunter in his case and it's like, look, I've just made my first three knives that I know they're not loveless. I actually showed him, I said, can I hold that knife? I can't afford it. I won't scratch it. Don't have anything on. And he was able to, uh, he was kind enough to let me look at that knife, hold it, you know, look at it, see what it was. And it's pretty amazing. Um, the first time, especially when you've only read about, you've only seen the kind of collector craze about it. And I'm kind of enamored with 
a lot of knives nowadays, you know, when you, oh my goodness, what makes that knife special? And then you see them, it's like, oh, that's what it is. And that's exactly what a loveless knife is. It's at first, it's, it's almost a visceral kind of like, oh, now I kind of understand. Uh, and I, I was, yeah. I kind of got ahead maybe of that point is that, uh, we oftentimes in the knife world, especially in, among makers, well, the only sharp edge on a knife should be the edge of the knife or, or something like that. The only sharp edge should be the, the blade on the blade. Well, it really is taken above and beyond on a loveless knife. And it is meant to be used in every way. Um, it's meant to be kind of the ultimate, you know, even though they're thin hollow grinds, um, they're meant to be as abusable as possible. And I'll use as an example the fact that uh, in modern times, they got away from soldering guards. And there's some talk, oh man, why would they do that? That's so pretty when you have a beautiful solder, uh, solder fillet there, and it's so nicely buffed and everything's so fantastic. Yeah, but what's happening underneath the guard if the flux isn't neutralized. And they started seeing that, oh man, right, we're having right. flux leach out. Oh my goodness, what happens if that corrodes the steel to the point that it breaks there? All of those things are taken into account and goes back to my first that it was the Loveless shop was always looking at improving. It wasn't just, oh, we make what we make and we're good to go and we're making all this money. Let's just sit back and make all this money. Nope. Let's continue working and let's continue trying to improve everything and making the best usable knives that we can, even if you couldn't afford it. So that's where I was going with that. Very cool. So the uh, kind of just went over what, uh, in my way, I call it the philosophy uh, and what ends up being the loveless knife. It's also interesting to point out, I think we touched on it earlier, that uh, the Loveless shop, we talked about catalogs and things like that. And the fact that, well, in the talk of it being a, a user knife, if you look at those old catalogs, there were always folders in it, in those catalogs. There was H.H. Uh, Frank folders, there was Barry Woods folders, and then I believe it, uh, the last folders to be offered were Jess Horn folders. And that goes along with not being a, a, a collector or a knife maker that was building collectible knives. Uh, the thought process was that we wanted to be able to offer knife enthusiasts, knife users, anything they wanted, whether it was one of our belt knives, whether it be a hunter, a fighter, even a folder. And uh, so that's why there seemed to be always that relationship in, uh, I guess, up into the 80s. Uh, with a folder maker. Uh, and that's how there, there's a lot of, uh, oh, again, urban myths, because when we talk about names and you hear, oh, Stiff Horn, oh, that's Jess Horn. And, uh, well, Jess Horn mate, no. It was one of those things that I, my understanding is that uh, Bob and uh, Barry Woods had some type of falling out. I'm not sure what it was, but they kind of. Yeah, I saw a letter that referenced that, yeah. They went their separate ways and Bob still wanted, he was in the process of doing a new catalog and stuff and still wanted to offer folders in his catalog. And so he actually designed a knife and he had a, a relationship. This was when uh, Jess was living in Redding, California and actually contacted him and is like, hey, I really like your work. Would you make this knife for me? And that's what that knife became a stiff horn because Bob made the fixed blade version and Jess Horn made the folding, uh, a slip uh -huh. joint style with a very, uh, it's not quite a worn, it's, it's a modified worn cliff, I guess you'd call it. You know, it's yeah. kind of a pen knife type blade. Um, but you also see in the work, there was evidently a very uh, mutual, very much a mutual respect because if you Google, do a, a Google images search on Jess Horn, the fixed blades, there's a, a, quite a number of fixed blades and they're all loveless patterns. Now they weren't done very well. And that's what I find funny is uh, Jim always said, ah, Jess Horn didn't like making 
fixed blades. And Bob had no interest in making folders. And so you see that, you can actually see it uh, in the fixed blades that you see on Google Image that Jess Horn made. And, uh, but he was a wizard on, on folders. And that's what they were offered, uh, how they came to be offered in the uh, Loveless catalog. Yeah. At one point, my understanding is there, there's a spare room. It became the storage room at the Loveless shop. At one point, there was actually, and this uh, is a story that came from John Wilson. John Wilson worked for a number of years in the Loveless shop. Uh, he's a Canadian. Don't think poorly of him. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. But he did uh, the he did their leather work. He uh, came in and Bob taught him how to do their leather work, and he worked for actually quite a number of years just building leather or doing leather for the level shop. And uh, there was actually at some point talking talk about Jess Horn moving into the level shop into that back workroom, and so they would be one complete knife shop. Wow! So they in the front would build fixed blades. Jess Horn in the back would build folders. Everything came together, shipped from one location, made in one location, and away you go. Huh. I find those things pretty incredible. Yeah. And I'll just, just a little, I guess, just commentary. I find it incredible because so many times in our current, I guess, uh, you know, telling of stories, Bob Loveless is this grouchy, crotchety old man that everybody was afraid to approach. And, and most of the people that I talked to outside of the, the, the knife show world loved him. Yeah. Yeah, he was a grumpy guy, but they had respect for him. And he actually tried to do as much for people as, you know, they did for him. And so I think that's a pretty powerful thing to think about nowadays when we're talking about sharing information or helping each other out and helping each other grow, or even when you see crazy collaborations going down. You know, maybe it's a, a really cool new maker and a really crusty old good knife maker like Tom Crone <laughs> working together. Crusty. You know. Damn um, it. <laughs> extra crusty. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so those are kind of what I try to take away from things is that there's always a backside to things and there's stories that maybe aren't told and people don't know and that's when I allude to kind of urban legends and things that uh, are told that maybe aren't quite actually true. And that's why I encourage people to look at history of anything they're interested in. Maybe try to dig up what the real thing is. Right, right. So, Mark, I've got a question for you. You, you mentioned that the, the Wood Loveless relationship went south. What what happened there? I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Is, you know, what did, what did you dig up on that? Just curious. Well, there was one of the websites had a collection of uh, of letters and documents, and in there was it was kind of like a miscellaneous thing, right? Some of these were letters to customers and other stuff, and it looked like Bob had sent out a letter that s- said, you know, they initially they were taking orders for the Loveless wood folders, and then so they accepted deposits and a bunch of stuff, and then. Bob ended up writing this letter and sending it out saying, Hey, this isn't working. You know, Barry Wood's not holding up his part of the deal. I, again, there's always three sides to every story, right. but there was this, this letter that where he basically said, we're not going to do this. And, um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It is pretty interesting. It, do you have any more insight on that, David, on that, the background of that, or just that there was a falling out and it kind of ended? Yeah. That the only thing that I ever heard was, uh, those words, there was a falling out. And uh, I didn't even think about Googling it or trying to find out. Um, yeah, that's all I know. Yeah, cool. I'll send you a copy of that. It was very interesting to look at. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, one one thing I'd like to touch on, and it's on your list, is uh, his philosophy on sheaths. And I, you know, uh, early on in my career, you know, I, I had that book and and it was pretty influential. And so I've always thought that a sheath is just as important than a knife, maybe more important because without a sheath, you can't carry it. And it kind of feels like that was Bob's philosophy and, and his sheaths were kind of works of art. Um, and I was just wondering if you wanted to touch on that and if, if you had any more insight on that. 
I'm not sure that I have insight, but uh, you know, when I've, I've been thinking about this, you know, chat over the last couple of weeks, and it's like uh, when you're talking to a new collectors or new makers, things like that. It's what you know. What would I try to get across to them? And man, I agree with you, Tom. And it seems like so often, folks. Well, they'll ship a fixed blade in a pouch. I'm not a leather. I, I don't make sheaths. I'm a knife maker. And, well, there's uh, even guys that don't don't it was, provide a sheath. There's even companies. I mean, Boosie is one. They don't. You don't get a sheath. Well, that's what I'm saying. They when I say, that's what I'm saying. When when I say a pouch, oh, right? It's yeah, just a zippered yeah. case. You know, the 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 collectible zippered case. Um, and so the whole point, and it's it's funny. Again, I. I if I had a man crush, if I had a, a, you know, if I idolized anybody, it would be Jim Merritt. And, you know, so everything that I know, and he was continuing until the end, the same way things were done. Um, the sheath was supposed to, under any circumstances, protect the user from the knife. And so that went so far as, so the, the famous drop hunter, and you may have seen videos or, again, I encourage folks to try to find one and be able to inspect it for themselves. If there's a sheath with it, look at how that knife fits and then try to flex that sheath. It don't flex. Uh, the loveless knives were on. The welting wasn't just saddle skirt. It wasn't just a oh, 10, 11 ounce or, or a super heavy, thick uh, leather or even stacked leather, they use that compressed shoe sole leather oh, wow. for the welting on their sheaths, and that's why they went through. They went. They were always going through stitching machines. I think they went through three in the eight years that wow. I was down there, um, because they're stitching through that compressed hard. The only way you can cut, they actually in the leather room had a <laughs> bandsaw because the only way to cut that leather is with a wood bladed <laughs> bandsaw or a, a you know bandsaw with yeah, a wood wow. cutting blade. And uh and so that that's where I wanted to go is they put as much effort, as much thought, and and it's funny because Jim never ever talked poorly about people or about their knives. And you'd say, oh man, did you see this knife? He'd go, yeah, I saw that. That's a pretty nice knife. Well you sure can't make a sheath. <laughs> and so that that was one of the hardcore principles or the pack part of the package of a loveless knife is that sheath. And you even look at the um, the fighter style sheaths, how they had that tongue that came up over the guard and then a keeper strap that went around it. There is no way that that fighter is coming out. Uh, one of... Evidently, one of the original battle knives made was carried, don't want to misquote, either Iraq or Afghanistan by a Marine upside down on his chest. And the original battle knife was not as big as the ones that they ended up being. But uh, they were kind of a jump rated, very secure, very stout, inflexible sheath. And that's why I believe they started looking, well, maybe Kydex would be easier to deal with than the stinking leather we're using right now. Um, but that's what I wanted to get across is that a knife, a custom knife, a belt knife, man, that sheath is just as important. And you knew knife makers, maybe got to look and maybe become adept at, at leather also, or get a good sheath maker for you or that works with you, that you work with. Because that's just as important. Question for you, David. Have you seen any of Bob Dozier's recent leather sheaths? Not recent. Check it out. I mean, I don't know what you mean by yeah, recent. Yeah, in the last few years, last 10, 10, 15 years. He's, like I said, you know, I worked for him in the late 90s and he was basically setting up his leather shop at that time and had talking with Loveless and had been out there a couple of times. And uh, I think he's mm -hmm. he's building some sheaths that would, that, that Bob uh, Loveless would be proud of. Uh, he's, he's, they, they actually snap in, you know, the welt, the guard and everything. Right. They actually snap in. So they're he, pretty neat stuff. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, 
the way it works. And just, again, I don't want to be rambling because I could talk all night. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. So, so the, when they had the sale for the shop, I guess now two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, um, a fellow came out cause he just wanted to see the shop and he's a newish knife maker and his claim to fame, he's a pretty accomplished leather worker. And when we were going through some of the areas, we found a lot of partially or never used sheaths. They were done or never went out with a knife, whatever. And this fella, he's an older fella looking at these sheaths and he's like, holy cow, man. I thought that only real leather workers knew these secrets. You know, I, he never imagined that uh, a knife maker would take so much care and put so much engineering into a sheath. And now, of course, he's trying to make some knives and kind of going down that path. But I thought it was pretty incredible. He was showing us some of his work. And he's a saddle maker, bridle maker, you know, leather that gets used. And Very cool. uh, it was interesting to hear that. So anyway. So in our notes, we had some stuff about innovation type things. And we talked about, or uh, I noted some stuff about kind of popularizing the use of micarta as a handle material. And you had a, a talking point, David, that talked about micarta versus stag done the loveless way. You want to give us some words about the way those materials were approached by the level shop? I, I think it's funny because micarta, even since I had, I made my first knives in 2010, end of 2010, and uh, micarta was frowned upon even nine years ago, eight and a half years ago, whatever it was. And it's it's a resurgence now. You see everybody with green canvas micarta, and that's like uh, everybody's hunting down all the Westinghouse and all these things. And uh, it was funny because it's originally, now it's a collectible, and I'm sure Bob would roll over in his grave because, <laughs> you know, oh my Lord, what have I done? But uh, it's one of those things that... Uh, it was initially used because he could shape it. Number one, it was stable. Uh, it was friendly and cold. It was friendly when it was wet. And you could shape it to fit your hand and the way he wanted the loveless knife to, to feel. And it's, it's hilarious because uh, I think we were having a conversation before. Uh, how can you tell different eras of the loveless knife and out of the loveless shop? And uh, when you see stag knives that have almost no bark on them, they're just basically pure white with a few brown streaks on them. Those are knives that Bob made because he tried to treat stag just like micarta. Uh, he would grind through everything so that he could shape that knife handle just like he would a micarta handle. And so it's funny because... Uh, only recent, more recent history when you see these incredibly beautiful big bears and baby bears and junior bears and, and stag, amber stag and such that are perfectly matched and all the, the you know, popcorn and cragginess is left intact. That was all Jim Merritt's work. Ah, well, yeah, yeah. this is a collector's market and collectors are buying these very expensive knives and they don't want white bone handles. Right, right. They they pay for all the character. And so I, I think that's very interesting because you can look, you visually, looking at just photographs, well, most likely 99% Bob did that one and Jim did that one. And so, but in the same vein, those were, in, in, in Bob's mind, those were the only two acceptable handle materials, Macarta or Stag. Because huh. stag was wore so hard, especially the old, you know, uh, sandbar stag that you could get years ago. Almost no pith, uh, very stable, hardworking, didn't crack. You know, it was very much like natural micarta. And only, again, in more recent history, did you see fancier handle materials pop up as the prices went up and the collector started, you know wanting different things. Right. Yeah, you are you're talking about things like pearl or or ivory or that exactly. fancy stuff. Bob yeah. Bob exactly. wouldn't use ivory yeah. from what I understand. He he made one knife with it and that was it, right? Um 
That I can't speak to. I don't know. They, I, I think I read somewhere that he uh, he stated he would no longer use it because if people stopped using it, hopefully people would stop poaching elephants or something. That's in the logos of the Loveless. Well, some of the most some of the most beautiful Loveless knives you'll see uh, are the hidden pin knives, and you started seeing those more kind of the last 20 years or 10 years before Bob's uh, passing and such, then you'll, of course, you'll immediately, oh, holy cow, there's no loveless bolts in them. They're just pure. And that was their answer to a lot of the more fragile materials. And so they had worked out a system that uh, using threaded rod as inserts through the tang and that threaded, uh, those threads as an anchor in conjunction with epoxy, they had this hidden pin system that they worked out. And it was very precise, and they had jigs and everything built so that everything locked in and uh, almost like a keyhole type of a system, but in conjunction with a threaded rod. But that's when you saw this more fragile. Like you'll see, I think Dave Ellis, uh, every once in a while on Facebook, will show ivory handled knives, but they'll be hidden bolts. Uh, you'll see some pearl handles, not so much those because sometimes the the newer newer pearl was so thin. But uh, that's the only thing I can speak to. I don't know. I never read that Bob said he wouldn't use it because it was used. But oftentimes you saw him with the the hidden pins. Yeah, there's definitely more than one, Tom. I don't. So maybe maybe he just stopped at some point and there was one yeah, more in the shop so. or something like that. Cause he definitely says that he, in that book uh, and at some point he, he says he will no longer right. use elephant ivory. Or it could be one of those things that, uh, you know, because of collector demand, he revisited that and right. Right. You know, they made a, a decision. Well, let's try to work out a way of doing it so we don't have to worry about cracks or, or whatever. Yeah, it's on it's on page ninety seven. It says Bob Loveless. Mm-hmm. Uh, knife making is governed by his personal ideals. We won't do an ivory handle. There's one in the leather room that will be the last. It's if enough people would stop using ivory, maybe that would stop poaching elephants in Africa. Gotcha. And he says ivory is a second or third class handle, anyways. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny, uh, you know. Well. It is kind of, if it, it goes against the whole usable knife, really. I, I've personally never seen a, a an ivory-handled knife with any age on it that doesn't have some checking or cracking. So, you know, it, it, it kind of flies in the face of a usable knife or one that's meant to last through the ages. Okay, so we talked about Loveless and his love for uh, lots of different things. He... As Tom said, he he was clearly into a lot of the same stuff that a lot of us like. Obviously, a deep love of knives. He was into cameras. I I love camera stuff. Um, Watches, motorcycles, airplanes. Uh, Had a love of cars. It sounds like it was a Fiat that they took from Delaware out to California, a little Fiat Abarth, which is very cool. Um, And and a deep, deep love of guns and and modifications to guns and like you've been kind of talking all along david improvements to guns and other stuff um we mentioned earlier this whole micro shop that bob had and maybe that's almost like a little project shop or something or a a business separate or parallel to the knife thing what can you tell us about that yeah it was basically almost like a small job shop he would take in a little bit of work and it was literally in the hallway between the office and the main workroom of the shop. And there was a sign that hung there and there was a lathe and, and different things. That's also where he made the very obscure loveless pens, you know, so all of, uh, yeah. it seems that like it bleeds over. If you're into knives, it somehow goes to watches like Mark was saying. And now of course you have fancy pens and high tech pens and stuff. Again, kind of ahead of everybody back in the day, he made uh, fluted pens, checkered pens um, out of different materials. And uh, most of them were gifted. He also uh, 
and very few of them were actually marked. But you can definitely tell them. Once you've seen one, like if you've seen a fluted pen, oh, holy cow, that's a loveless pen. Huh. Very, most of them did not uh, retract. And it was hilarious because uh, one of them disappeared in Long Beach fairly recently. Jim had the one that he carried in it. He always wore a blue work shirt and always had his loveless pen in his pocket that he used to mark everything in the leather room or whenever he was writing or whatever. And it didn't ever retract. I'm like, holy cow, that thing doesn't leak? Never leaks. And then the day he lost it, it leaked in his pocket. <laughs> he went to the, it leaked. There's a big blue spot on his shirt. Oh, jeez. Went to the post office to, to mail something. And he left it on the post office counter. Oh. Never to be seen again. But uh, yeah, so anyways, ahead of his time, as far as, uh, you know, cool guy stuff, gadgety stuff, uh, there were turn, uh, hanging in the shop were uh, Turner's Cubes uh, projects, things like that, that really? uh, he was into. Very cool. Uh, he talked about cars, uh, motorcycles, big and Japanese motorcycles. Evidently, at one point, he owned somewhere between eight to ten uh, motorcycles were parked outside the shop because if something new came out, got to have it. And a lot of them were Yamaha and, and things like that. So again, the affection for Japanese culture kind of continued. And so going along with uh, the micro shop or just kind of diversification, it wasn't just a knife shop. And we've kind of hit on it quite often throughout the talk with guns. And uh, I'll post a few photographs. I have to kind of edit it to protect names and stuff, but some correspondence to Bob with, hey, can you modify this gun and do these recognized RW Loveless adjustments? Uh, he was known for uh, melting all the edges, lightning slides, uh, doing trigger jobs. And and that was kind of when the big claim is... Uh, big blow up started blow up as far as popularity goes is there was a, a significant article in gun digest and don't ask me about what year, but it was, uh, if I remember the one I saw, it was, he was, uh, it was on the front cover of one of the gun digest vo uh, volumes. And a lot of people took notice and to today you can go on different gun forums and the, the loveless modified guns are discussed and there are topics that come up quite frequently. Yeah. So, like I said, I use the word diversified, diversified. You know, that wasn't just knives. And, you know, his thoughts on making things usable, better, uh, working better, carried through everything. So, like David said, if you're not in our Facebook group, it's worth checking out. There are some very cool things that get shared in that group most times related to the show in some way or another. And David's got a treasure trove of cool pictures and, and info that he'll likely share with us here over, over time after the episode comes out. So definitely check out the Facebook group, um, Mark of the Maker Facebook group on, on Facebook. And there'd be some really neat things that appear in there. David, you, you recently, very recently last week, I guess, were at the shop. Um, and basically the shop is, it's being sold. The stuff's auctioned off. What, what's happening with the original Loveless shop or the Riverside shop, I should say. So the business, uh, like I said early on, uh, when Jim went to work there, it wasn't that Jim ever was an employee. From day one, they became partners. Money was split. Responsibilities were split. And so that's in this case, uh, the Loveless, excuse me, the Merritt family uh, ended up with the responsibility of closing everything down because that was their understanding. That was the trust that uh, whichever one passed, the other one could choose to continue. And Jim did. Jim worked three days a week until he passed. And uh, you know, I, I had conversations with him. I was like, well, why don't you go fishing? He wasn't a fisher person, but, you know, what, do something else because he drove from Long Beach into Riverside three days a week. And nowadays that's not a fun commitment. Right, right. It's like, man, he says, I don't care if I never sell another knife. 
He says, I love making knives. And he says, I'll do it until I die. And so that was one of the last conversations I had. Um, Cause over the last couple of years, different things started occurring with his health. But anyways, um, I guess it would be two, not this weekend, but last they had set the date. It was, uh, on Facebook, there were a couple announcements. I believe there was an announcement in Blade Magazine that there was going to be an auction. And so the, the Loveless shop was officially closed when Jim passed. Um, everything associated with patterns, uh, everything from sheath patterns to, to stamps to knife patterns, everything are gone. And... Basically, anybody that wanted a piece of the level of shop for either posterity, uh, posterity, or to use as an up-and-coming knife maker or, you know, whatever fascination with the level of shop could go and purchase. The property hasn't been sold. It still sits there. But, uh, yeah, the level of shop piece of history is gone besides photographs. Yeah. End of an era for sure, right? Oh, absolutely. I will, uh, not embarrassed because, you know, I, I believe in, in recent years, maybe in my old age, I've, uh, learned that you got to let people know what you think of them. You got to let people know how much you appreciate them. And, uh, I owe them a lot. And I will, I will say that it was, uh, well, it's emotional right now. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. a very difficult thing to let go of and, you know, I just hope I make them proud. Yeah. It's very cool that you were able to be there for that, David. And um, like you said, you don't always have a chance to to say the things that you need to say to people or, or you know, necessarily have any kind of closure with stuff. And in this case, you know, never a happy thing, but oh, no. having the opportunity is, uh, is a good thing. Well... Yeah, sometimes you just got to do it, though. Like I said, I, I've pride myself in recent years trying to let people know what I think and appreciate everybody. You know, talking to Tom a couple weeks ago, it's like, dude, you are the inspiration for this. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think maybe it happens enough. There's nothing we do is going to save the world, change the world, affect the world in, in the whole scheme of things. But we all enjoy it. And, you know... Maybe sometimes people are way too critical of knife makers. Maybe sometimes knife makers are way too critical of their customers. I just wish everybody would let each other know how much they're appreciated and well how said. much we appreciate each other and what we do. Yeah. So that's that. Yeah. Well said. All right. Well, so one of the, uh, maybe a fun thing to do here before we wrap up is to talk a little bit about, um, I mean, these are all, very, very iconic designs and patterns that, as Michael pointed out very early on in the show, lots and lots of people make knives in this style, right? It's a, it's a very prolific set of designs. And so favorite patterns, um, Sean, what's your favorite loveless pattern? Uh, easily the loveless fighter. Love that knife. I mean, it is so sleek and elegant and it's dangerous and it's everything a fighting knife should be. So can I interrupt there? I'm going to put you on the yep. spot. What loveless fighter? Oh, uh, the six inch. <laughs> okay. The double edge six inch loveless fighter. Okay. Very so good. is that a, the Dixon? one that's featured prominently in the knife fighting book he was part of? Yeah. That you know, oh holy cow that opens up a whole other thing I didn't even write down. So yeah, I won't, <laughs> I won't carry on. But uh, the Dixon is a completely different knife than the six inch fighter, and that's a common confusion among collectors specifically and i'm i'm proud of sean that he chose a six inch fighter in my opinion that is the most balanced between handle blade width from spine to edge that was made uh the dixon to me absolutely the dixon to me when you compare them in my opinion just doesn't look quite right so anyways that's that but the the, dixon the dixon is a smaller version right it's slightly smaller, and yeah. because of that, it just, I don't know, doesn't quite look as nice. 
But does it have a slightly different guard also, the Dixon? No, because everything was very, again, going back to my term, the Loveless formula, um, everything was very formulaic. So every single guarded hunter had the exact same guard. Every single fighter from basically a five inch fighter up, up to a, a lugged guard, the same thing. So what happens is the profile changes, the width from spine to edge change, the handle ratio, uh, the clip length, all those things change to become a different model. So anyways, so I'm proud of you, Sean. You picked the right Thank one. Thank you. That don't hurt my feelings yeah. a damn bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, most folks say that Dixon, and, and it's in the fighter, besides a big bear, oh, it's shoot knife, Dixon, or big bear. Really? Do you know what you're talking about? And I'm not talking down to anybody. <laughs> But uh, that's why I had to ask, what what loveless fighter? Because that's a very generic term. Yeah. So, yeah. awesome. What about you, Birch? What's your favorite uh, favorite loveless? Well, since you're going to say Big Bear, uh, <laughs> I really like the uh, the New York Special. Something about the lines oh, of that, no. I just love. Yeah, man, it's got interesting lines. The handle specifically is very interesting. Mm-hmm. It is. It's not something I would expect Tom to like that. No, I'm. I, I actually don't like that one because we made them Dozier. We made some, and I for whatever reason I never liked that model. In in my opinion, it's one of the most expensive loveless knives. It's the worst loveless knife. Ooh. So you're not so, proud of me? <laughs> I see how it is. No, I'm <laughs> not. You didn't hear me. I was talking over you. I said, "Oh man, how dare you!" So <laughs> beautiful lines, but it's interesting lines for me. Well, it, it's very, it, it's awkward. It's, it's basically a three finger knife and yep. only kind of works in a, in kind of a retarded saber grip. Uh, Cause <laughs> your thumb doesn't really quite fit on that top ring. Uh, that's why Birch likes and it. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I just, <laughs> every, everybody <laughs> listening to this, unless it gets cut, is just going to be, cause that's, most people and uh then the bottom grind because it's a pure stabber uh the way it's built but the top bevel on that knife is taller than the main bevel they're hard to and grind. so when you actually look at it it's like what in the world the lower bevel is short it would definitely not be a good edc like so i say it's a pure stabber but uh it's it's an interesting knife it's just mm -hmm. not one i like <laughs> It's nice for you, yeah, Birch. Exactly. Yeah. Bob Bob made a New York special Dozier. And uh, mm -hmm. I hated grinding them and they never felt good to me in the hand. So that's it's rough. Yeah. I wish I had that. I wish I had the wah 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 Debbie Downer music queued up in the in the little soundboard. I would have played it after David's disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> I did and I did. I think I did not. I was not prepared to hear that because most <laughs> folks that most folks that talk to me know my feelings, and uh, if they talk to me about loveless knives, and uh, I didn't, I hadn't prepared myself. I hadn't steeled myself to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. All right, Tom. What about you? So, you know, it was funny when you when you when we brought this up. You know, David assumed everybody was going to choose a shoot knife, which I love the design. Um, I love the drop point, but the knife I'm going to pick is the three inch Piker with stag. Ooh. Wow. Nice. It's, it's, I love the simplicity of the design and it's a, a small knife, something you could carry. If I, if it wasn't that, I'd probably choose like uh, the city knife or something like that. But uh, I love the smaller, smaller loveless knives. Absolutely. And especially when you see a match while well, they did, uh, they varied because they had the loveless caping set, which was the Randall as yeah, a skinner. And a piker. And a, yeah. And uh, that's an awesome set. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love that skinnier blade shape of the, they, they were so well done in their smaller knives, like the lamb and the, the piker and the city knife, stiff horn, yeah. all that. Yeah. What about you, David? The one that got me into the, down the loveless rabbit hole is a shoot. Yeah. I, it's, it's, 
I, I have photographs of uh, the drop hunter and the shoot together, and I think those are probably the most iconic, besides maybe the big bear. But uh, I don't know. The shoot is, and maybe it goes back to you know kind of the Rambo era, the survival knife. It was meant to be a survival knife. Yeah. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's a shoot. I think at last count, I have. 14 of them from different makers. Wow. And uh, I have two left to acquire. And then my list for shoot knives is complete. That's fantastic. So I'm a little bit anal. That's cool. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a list maker. And <laughs> when I got into knives, instead of just going nuts and buying everything, I, David, you got to make a list. What's the most interesting? Who are the guys that you want from? Make that list. Get it ordered. By direct, and that's what I did. Very nice. Nice. Geez, Mark, I wonder what yours would be. Yeah, it's very sweet of you guys to leave the big bear <laughs> for me. That's definitely my favorite. <laughs> Which is an epic choice. It, it kind of is. I mean, it, it's the least practical, most badass, uh, super iconic thing. I that to me that. I don't know. That's what I think of when I think of Loveless. Dave thinks of shoot. I think of Big Bear. I don't know why. That's just what always comes in, pops in my head. Definitely the most iconic of a sub hilt configuration. Lots of people do it, but immediately, holy cow. Yeah. I need to do what you described, David, and find someone that has one that will actually let me handle it. I, I would love to do that. <clears throat> You're going to, I don't know if he goes, but the second person I didn't mention, if we're getting to that point, uh, Lu Chow at the same show I mentioned earlier where, uh, Mark Strauss allowed me to inspect a drop hunter yeah. and then ran into Lu Chow and his display of the different ages and different stages and different, uh, progressions of the big bear over the years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had my very rough, very horrible first knives. Look, I'm trying to be a knife maker. I'm enthralled with this. I'll come behind the table. And he, I th yeah, holy cow, you know, quite the collection. He let me touch and hold every single one of them to my heart's content. And I've done that every show from, the, you know, Blade, every time I see a Loveless knife, because they're older. You know, usually the ones you see in cases are older, older right. than I've been in knife making. Oh, I got to see that. I got to see how it was different or how it feels and, you know, so... Yeah, very cool. All right. Well, this thing ran long. We knew it would run a little bit long. Maybe it ran a little longer than we expected, but, but I I really enjoyed this conversation, guys. It's been a very interesting episode, and hopefully we uh, paid some respect to the Loveless shop in putting this together. I don't. I hope so. I appreciate you guys. No, I appreciate you, man. Thank you very much for joining us. You gave us a lot of information. Yeah. Heck yeah. Very cool. Well, I have to uh, make a little uh, announcement here, or a plug for the Northwest Handbuilt Invitational Show. We, we usually talk about shows. I'm going to say show a bunch of times in a row. We talk about shows at the end of the show each time. And coming up here in July, so July 12th and 13th this year is the second Northwest Handbuilt Invitational Show up in Portland. Um, our friend Jade Marsh puts this show on and uh, of Starling Gear, and it sounds like it's a very cool event. David, you had a favorable experience l last year. Yes, it's uh, you know it's kind of a, a micro show, very kind of intimate if you want to use that term. Um, relaxed, plenty of knives to go around. You know, knives to entrance, if you will. Yeah. So. A pretty awesome deal. Yeah. So that's a very cool one coming up soon, July 12th and 13th uh, in Portland. It's a two, I say 12th and 13th, but it's not a two day show. It's a one evening show. The show's Saturday from 5 to 11 p.m. on July 13th. And then Friday night, the guys from Starling Gear have a, a club called Bible Club that by all appearances is absolutely fabulous and david your experience is consistent with that right pretty amazing place to check out if i remember my time periods cor correctly it's based on a 20s speakeasy yeah. uh down to the glasses every piece of glassware is like leaded crystal no two persons has a similar glass 
It's dark. It's an old building. It's pretty rad. Yeah, it sounds awesome. So I'm going to see if I can trick my wife into coming with me and go out to that one. But um, you're going to be there, David. I don't, th- none, Tom, Michael, Sean, you guys aren't going, right? No, uh, we all, correct. We're on vacation. There's a, there's actually another show before that yeah. coming up pretty quick. Blade show? Ah. <laughs> right. So, Tom, where's your location at Blade Show? Oh, my gosh. Uh, table six. Uh, let me Google that just to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> table or booth, Tom? I've got a booth. Right. Michael, do you remember your table number? Are you in the same spot, 16A? Oh, yeah. I don't leave. I don't change. <laughs> I'm a fixture. David, you'll be at Blade Show wandering around? Are you displaying or? No. Just... Due to personal things that have happened, I'm staying closer yeah. to home this okay. year. And so Blade, my next show is the Portland show that yeah, you just nice. mentioned. Uh, the ever fabulous Sean Kendrick and myself will be at Blade show this year as uh, roving representing- correspondents. <laughs> yes, we will be like last year, roving correspondents with a recorder and a microphone talking to some people. and. Uh, so yeah, that'll be really, really cool. Tom, did you figure out where you are at, the sh- at Blade Show this year? I am. And sorry for the confusion. They changed the, the my number this year. The booth is in the same place, but I'm 641 this year. 641. All right. So look for the wood chips. Yeah, we're probably not going to do that this year because that was a pain to clean up. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, right. Look for the Arby's wrappers because Tom's having Arby's at booth six. What is it again? 41. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? It would. You should work on that. You remember they had Arby's at the exit last two years? They had brought in boxes of Arby's? Yeah. If it was, <laughs> it would have been better if it was me doing it, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, too funny. Somebody beat you to the trend setting. I had a great idea, but anyways. Whatever. Idea thieves. Right. Okay. Oh, no, they had Chick Fil A. It wasn't our Chick Fil A. That's Chick-fil-A. exactly right. Uh, it was Chick Fil A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that line was always long. Way better than Arby's. Arby's would be good. You need to see. Here's what you got to do, Tom. <laughs> you got to do some. Remember Andy's thing where he had people bring pizza and a case of beer. That was pretty funny. Yes, and it's smart. He's thinking, Tom. Someone brings him lunch and a drink. I know, but so I, I wanted some, to do it. <laughs> Get your Arby's and Snapple, whatever, whatever works for you. (laughs) Snapple. (laughs) I don't know, man. Yeah. Well, David, thank you again very, very much for joining us for the show. It's very kind of you to take the time. And I know you did a bunch of research and prepped some things. So thanks uh, very much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it so much. Yeah. thank That was, that was a lot of fun. It was. We, uh, we think we're going to trick David into coming on again and actually doing a David Sharp interview episode. Yes. So we got to work on that. Um, (laughs) We probably should have done that first. So people know who people who aren't familiar with David know who he is, but we'll do it this way because that's how it worked out. But um, so David, we look forward to having you join us and uh, tell us about your own little personal knife making journey. And because I think you have a very interesting story to share with us. Oh yeah. I'll think about it. (laughs) Depends on how the ratings come out on this episode. Exactly. So <laughs> going to be awesome. Yeah. All right. We run awfully long. Thanks everybody for sticking with us this long. Uh, Birch, how many people you think are still listening? Uh, five. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than we've gotten in some cases. I think we've guessed zero in the past on these long episodes, but um, thanks to everybody for listening and checking out the show. Hopefully you learned a little bit about Loveless or gained a little bit of appreciation about some things maybe you did or didn't know before. And um, thanks as always for listening. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Sleep tight. To learn more about our makers, you can find Tom Crine on the web at crineknives.net. In his Facebook group, Crine Knives, or in his Instagram account, at Crying Knives. For Michael Birch, check birchtreeblades.com, Facebook group Birch Tree Blade Works, 
or Michael's Instagram at Birch Tree Blades. For myself and the Raygun Bead Project, we're on the web at raygundivision.com. We have a Facebook group called Raygun Division or my personal Instagram at msteiner. For those interested in photos, references from the show, or some discussion about the show itself, you can find us on the web at markofthemaker.com, in a Facebook group called Mark of the Maker, or on our Instagram at Mark of the Maker. Last but not least, the ultra cool and haunting background music we use for the show is a piece called Noir Guitar by Stevie's Amp Shack, found at the Free Music Archive and licensed under Creative Commons CC BY 4.0. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.